Good morning. Uh, for the record, Jeff Fannin from Vermont NEA, here to talk about H3, the, uh, what I finally refer to as the Ethnic Studies Bill. Uh, good morning, and, and uh, hope everybody's back is feeling better than mine. <laughs> <That's fun. laughs> Shovel is a little bit, a little bit. Uh, it's, it's all good. Um, so uh, I have some testimony here. I'll pull up here, and I think that's my entire testimony. I think on the entire screen right there. Um, so I have copies if folks want that. Um, Very simply put, thank you. For, first off, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you about H3 today. Uh, simply put, we're in favor of H3. Um, I didn't get any more than that. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we do think there are some opportunities here to strengthen the bill. Uh, number one is uh, to include and make sure that it encompasses those uh, independent schools that accept public dollars. Uh, whether it's a good idea for public schools or private schools. If it's a good idea for public schools, we also think it's a good idea for the private schools to um, join on board in the effort. It's a statewide issue that we need to address. We think it's important, and we think it ought to include them. Um, a couple suggestions there. The other is the Standards Board for Professional Educators, i.e. the um, Standards Board. It's the licensing body that licenses teachers. Uh, it sets the standards for new teachers, as well as uh, renewing of teachers. Um, and we think they ought to uh, make note of this. As teachers go through license initially and re-licensure, they, we think it's important that they get some cultural competencies in this area. So we think that's part of the, uh, could be a way to strengthen the bill going forward for those educators who are in the school today. Um, and need some, some help, if you will, to get more up to speed. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that Vermont EA has been uh, trying its own um, for some time now to address this issue largely. We established a racial justice task force a couple of years ago, about three, four years ago, uh, working with folks from around the state um, with NEA's help and ABLE assistance um, and resources, we've been working very closely with the towns of Bennington for a couple, the last two years and Montpelier the last year or two as well, um, and working with those communities as well as the school to address the issue of racial, r racial uh, inequality and, and racial issues that those towns and others have found themselves to be in. The idea of the racial equity liaison position that we have is to go out and meet with our members and work with them and uh, make sure that they're sensitive, more sensitive than they might be otherwise, to the issues of race and inequality in our schools, their, their own implicit bias, uh, their institution institutional bias. And so we're trying to work on this and have been for a couple of years. Uh, we've got a website devoted to this, and we have actually have, actually have a Bess O'Brien produced movie, 30 minute film that's on the website, which is pretty cool. Very great movie. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, best, everything Best does is pretty impressive, and this is nonetheless uh, all, this, all the more, I think. So we are very much in favor of H3, uh, with a couple of suggestions along the way, but thank you very much for doing this. I'm happy to take any questions. I just need a reminder. Um, so our, our historic cattings, for example, when the state board issues um, standards, Curriculum standards, not curriculum. Right. We don't have a curriculum. Um, do the independent, the historic academies have to follow those as well? Um, to be an approved school? I think their standards are a little bit different. You should ask them directly exactly what they do follow and don't follow. My, my sense is that they largely, the, the four historical academies largely follow along, but that may, may not be true for all of the independent schools who accept public dollars. Uh, and I don't, I don't, don't know for certain. I don't know if Millmore is around or, or uh, Patty Conlon, who represents them as well, might be able to weigh in on that. I, I think it might not be a bad idea for us to get them in. Um, can you see if uh, Patty Conlon can come up? Patty Conlon, yeah. Right now? Um, don't know. 
just at some point <laughs> regarding um, the relationship of independent schools. Yes, right now. Right now. <laughs> um, the relationship between historic academies and the standards. I had a similar question James. also about, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Representative James. Thank you. Um, just a similar question about the licensing of the independent schools, their relationship to licensing. And independent schools? Mm -hmm. They are not required to be licensed. Many are, but not all. Um, so in order to be in the teacher retirement system, some of the academies are in the teacher re retirement system, but in order to be an individual teacher in the teacher retirement system, one must be licensed. So, uh, for example, I know that there are some teachers at St. Johnsbury Academy who at least were in the retirement system because they're licensed teachers. So I was going back a couple years, one being former representative Howard Crawford uh, was a licensed teacher at St. Johnsbury Academy and also in their teacher retirement system. You said they're not required to be licensed, but many are. That's correct. That's my understanding. They are not, I know there are many teachers that are not licensed, but many who are. Well, that's part of the independent school approval system. Yeah. Uh, so they're not, that would be the school wide, yeah. and not necessarily the license. And there was a much discussion last year at the end of the session over one particular issue. Right. Uh, correct. Yeah. Uh, and I believe we have a report coming back on that. Um, you might know better than that. I didn't follow yeah. at the end. There were other issues. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just checking in with Ted on that to, to follow up. And I know that you're listening very closely to everything I say. <laughs> um, just to follow up on where we are with um, the report on CTE licensing. I know that there was a group that met. Right. Um, in terms of the standards board for, for professional educators, are you suggesting that this start to be, um, this is something that in relicensing teachers uh, show some kind of evidence that they participated in? in well, I think, I think the standards, maybe I overstated here perhaps, and I, and I apologize for that, but certainly the standards board should be part of the working group or at least asked to come in and, and have a discussion. I'm sure that would happen because the standards that teachers, as some here know, uh, they, they've got to go through license renewal. And if they are going through that, we could, the standards board could require them to go through sort of a, a, a cultural comp uh, competency course uh, for everybody on renewal, as well as for new teachers coming into the profession, that they have some, have demonstrated at least some coursework in that area. And I think that's probably the, the goal, so that you can't change people overnight, but you can start getting them to think about it and get some training in it, and I think that's what will be necessary. That's why we're doing the work we're doing, meeting with teachers directly and yeah. having some conversations. So, Ted, if we could also get someone from the um, Standards Board for Professional Educators, that would be great. Thank you. And you can work that out with Shannon. Other questions? Representative Austin. Um, who is responsible for recruiting, let's say, minority teachers? Like, in, you know, bringing minority teachers to the law? Um, is that you? Or no, no, Vermont NEA doesn't recruit teachers. We don't hire people. Yeah. We don't hire yeah, yeah. or fire people. Yeah. Um, we, um, I think the schools, in Burlington, for example, has been a, a large example of that, where they've systematically decided we want to encourage people of different eth ethnicity to apply for teaching positions and other positions. And so they've taken it upon themselves to reach out to various communities and do that. So I think it's the school districts that, that have to do that. Most of them use uh, an online tool called School Spring. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's what, you know, that's sort of an online thing that they all contract with, or many schools contract with. But they, the schools do the recruiting now, not us. Okay. So you're suggesting that we follow up on the status on independent schools and, and the standards for this potential uh, Yes. To consider in this bill. I think it's just some way to improve it, perhaps. We think it's a great bill. Yeah. It's a good idea. It ought to happen in, in some fashion or another, and we think some slight additions and edits. You, you're on this group, aren't you? Yes, or my designee. Uh, it's a big group, uh, which is tough always. Um, but it's a big issue. Yeah. 
a lot of people want to weigh in. Especially when we're dealing with issues of inclusion. Right. <laughs> it's very I, difficult to not include. Not include. In this work group. Absolutely. Uh, but my experience has been larger groups like that are a challenge. And you heard this morning from Megan Roy, she's, I, I didn't hear her, I couldn't be here to hear her testimony, but that group, Act 173, I also serve on that. That's a big group as well. And you get a lot of different opinions. And you get, you need to have somebody who can manage those opinions as a chair to allow them all to come in. And, and uh, I assume that this group would, the working group here would select the right chair, let's hope, to allow everybody to have some input, whether they're on the group or outside. And many would be outside. Can't include everybody. Yeah, it, it's a group that seems to be gathering some moss as it rolls along here. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> um, other questions? Representative Cooper. Jeff, who is your racial equity liaison? That would be none other than Martha uh, Allen, who was our president last year. Uh, she left, uh, she term limited out on the presidency, and we uh, hired her for this. It's a temporary one year assignment, <clears throat> trying to figure out how to go forward with it. But she's. Um, She's the one who's been spearheading this for the last couple of years internally for us. And we just kept her on board for a half time, <coughs> time position, one year position. And then going forward, we're going to try to figure out how to do that. Continue the work. This is important work. Sure. It really is important work. And, and our folks are willing, but they have to be, um, you know, they're all entrenched in their day to day. They've got their kids, there's class, they've got homework that they would grade, assignments to give. And once in a while, it's really hard to pick your head up and take a longer view. And you need somebody to help you do that. And so that's what we were hoping to do. And none better, we thought, than uh, an educator mm -hmm. who's been in the classroom for 30 years, who knows what's going on in the classroom and can help folks, our members, pick their head up a little bit and uh, take a look at the longer view culturally and what we need to do as a state moving forward. That was the goal and it remains so. Thank you. Should we have her come? Uh, I can ask. She's all the way up and she works out of her home in Canaan. She's not here that often. Um, oh, wow. It's a long ways. So she's like New Hampshire, Canadian? Well, very much Vermont. Uh, but up in that neck of the woods, yes. It's pretty far up there. It's right on the Canadian border. We do, we do have uh, Wi-Fi here. And she does as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> but, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, she could certainly, uh, and I'll talk with Martha about seeing whether she's able to come in. Representative Austin. I, I'm Martha, it's like my best friend, and she may be here. She said she was coming to Montpelier to, to the State House on Thursday. Uh -huh. So she will be in town. I didn't want to overpromise her schedule because I, oh, I don't keep it. But. I, I can do it. Okay. <laughs> as, a, as a friend can. Because I already asked her if she would come. So. Oh. But anyway, if it fit into our schedule. Yeah, I certainly think she probably would. Yeah, we're pretty good on Thursday at this point in time. It's a question of whether we're going to be where we're going to be. Right. But, but I'm happy to, if she's going to be here. I, I will certainly ask. Yeah. And if, if it's Thursday, well, let's not aware. But, yeah. And then I'll check in with Shannon and see what your schedule is. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Rather brief, I know, <coughs> but supportive, but, 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 all the same. But helpful. Yes. Um, this is an important bill. Okay. Have a nice lunch. Thank you. All right. I think that we we will begin. Um, we're about to hear about the uh, letter to uh, the committees regarding a request for a delay. What I'd like to um, remind us is that uh, the focus before us is a very narrow question. It's a very narrow question related to will a delay help or hurt the process in your district? I want people to refrain from questions related to the tenets of the lawsuit. I want you to stay away from questions that ask about the lawsuit. Um, with the pros and cons of the lawsuit. Those are going to be the off limits. We're going to be narrowly focused on should we offer a delay or not. And with that, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, I have a question as to 
is there one of these bills in particular that we are talking about today with that question in mind? We are not. We're going to be talking about a letter that okay. um, Representative Sherman is going to present to us. Okay. So we're, we're going to put those bills aside for the moment and stay very focused on, on the letter before us. Okay. So with that, Representative Sherman. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all good, all good. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair, just for the record, uh, my name is uh, Representative Heidi Sherman. I represent uh, the community of Stowe um, and uh, uh, I've been in this building for a while. Um, so I'm here, thank you for, for doing this and for taking this time uh, so quickly and so um, so immediately in the session. Um, so we, um, we have, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, just talk about the letter. This is regarding um, specifically just the involuntary merger part of Act 46. That's it. You want me to press it? Um, so, so this is regarding Act 46, but as the chair said, and I, and I would reiterate this, we are really focusing on um, the uh, the involuntary merger section of, of, of Act 46, and specifically the state plan that was released in November um, by the State Board of Education and the, par the parts that uh, put together uh, these involuntary mergers, or recommend, um, or actually not recommend, they, they um, are putting into place these involuntary mergers. So specifically, so after the um, election and after the state plan, um, there was some communication among many of us um, here in this in this body, uh, new members, um, ex uh, members who were returning this year, um, and it was determined that there's a sort of a broad coalition of of folks uh, in this in this building, both in the House and in the Senate, um, who have concerns about the um, the timeline of these involuntary <coughs> mergers and. Um, uh, so we brought together a group of these of these folks, and again, we represent people uh, political views from across the spectrum. Um, there are progressives, independents, Republicans, Democrats, and it really is a, um, across the political spectrum here in uh, in the House, especially, but also in the Senate. You'll know it. Um, and we determined that the the one thing we could do um, to really help our districts and our areas was again just focused just to delay the implementation of this of these involuntary mergers by one year and that's what we're asking today um, and asking uh, this body to do and then the other body to do is to to not argue the merits of act 46 as most of you know i could probably do that for hours uh, but uh, but that's not the role that's not my request um, that is um, you know it is the law now i understand that and um, uh, but but the time frame and the timeline is 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 um, has become significantly problematic for many districts. Um, ours, uh, I can speak to ours a little bit more uh, clearly than other ones, just because I'm not familiar with ones. But ours is because ours was really not um, expected. I will say because ours was recommended by the state agency um, to actually the alternative governance structure was recommended to be approved. Um, so we did not expect the state board um, to, to actually force the merger on us. So we, um, just in terms of um, time frame, so what we're looking at is, you know, March is coming up very quickly, town meeting, votes are gonna happen in March, votes are gonna happen before that. We're really looking for an extended time frame to do this right. If we're going to do it, and we're going to, um, uh, do this merger, we um, are prepared. We can be prepared to do that, but we want to make sure it's done right. We have had experience in our supervisory union with Morristown and Elmore merging, going into a voluntary merger, uh, which has taken a number of years, and actually they're still in the process of doing that right now. Um, and it's it's working out. It's it's working out okay and fine, uh, but we have, we are um, we are very concerned with the ex expedited time frame um, that, that we won't be able to do it uh, well and do it right and it will harm our students um, and that is why we're requesting this. I will also say as an aside we do have 
a, 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 a lawsuit that is um, that is progressing, um, and so, and without getting into the details of that, as the chair said, we're, I, I don't, I watch Law and Order all the time, but I'm no lawyer, <laughs> and I, I couldn't tell you, um, you know, what what aspects of that lawsuit have have more merit than others. But uh, what I do know is, if if we were to uh, have to move forward with this merger now, and if afterwards. Uh, in July or after this merger happens, um, the plaintiffs were to succeed and were to win this case, it will be virtually impossible to unravel um, that that merged that newly merged district. And so, so we're asking. So that's one part of it. But really, our focus is also on making sure we have the time to do this right, making sure our voter experience is 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 sound, that people understand the process, that our taxpayers understand, that our voters understand. And these, these, um, this will be very difficult for voters um, to really um, understand, comprehend, and get in, and and their um, and their interest. We have a very engaged constituency throughout our district, uh, throughout our supervisory union. But it will be very difficult for people to understand um, all of the um, implications and the votes, the votes that will be forthcoming uh, in a very short time frame. So. So that's what we're asking for. Uh, there are two bills. Uh, one is, though, simply uh, an extension, an extension for one year, uh, for July 1, 2020, that will give the districts um, um, the time to put this into place and put it into place well uh, for the students, for the school districts, for the taxpayers. So. Questions? Uh, so I feel like I heard two things. Yeah, I heard me too. we need some time to do it right, and I heard. <clears throat> We don't think we can unravel it if we prove successful in court. Yep. So that that says we don't want to do it at all until there's a court decision. Well, that's that's true. We will if if we if the if the delay happens, we will. We're going through it right now. We're we're doing what we need to do absolutely. Uh, but uh, but if we're extended this delay, uh, this extension, we we would. I, I I can't tell you what the school board will decide to do or the school districts. But my assumption is they'll 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 uh, they'll hold it back for, for the time being so that we'll continue with our regular uh, budget and our regular uh, school board and what have you and then and then um, continue with it after the legal case is, is, is decided. That's probably true. Um, as long as it's decided soon. If not, they'll just continue with it, obviously, and continue going with uh, the, the, the merger as long, you know, to be prepared for, uh, for, for July 1, 2020, and even prior to that so that everybody's prepared at town meeting day in 2020. And basically one of the concerns is that uh, a one-year extension would then perhaps change it into a less expedited court case, and therefore uh, it could be a case that might last two years. Uh, you know, I know we're speculating. Right? We absolutely, I, I do think though both uh, the attorney general and um, in our case specifically, they've been, uh, they both have expressed um, the desire to do this. As quickly as possible um, to, to get, uh, uh, the attorney general, attorney general Donovan has, uh, from what I remember, and I could be wrong here, but from what I remember, I read that he he understood the need and has and um, and has made that clear that it needs to be done in a timely manner. Um, that he's hopeful that it'll be done in a timely manner, and certainly our attorneys in our school district are. And again, we we have a really um, two. Uh, high-performing districts with a, supervi a supervisory union that works well with both. So we'll move forward however we, we are required to move forward, and we'll be sure we're, we're going to be ready in 2020 if this happens. Um, and that's, I can assure you that, and we'll be ready to go. Um, and um, But in the meantime, I think, if, again, for voter experience, for taxpayers, for students, um, and to allow this legal case uh, to continue at least um, at least uh, in some short in short time that um, that we ask for this extension. Yeah. Of course, time, timely manner also includes the fact that there's pressure on. Yes, yes, and there is. And um, again, we uh, so our, our district is a little is a little different, but we've been working on various organizational changes in our supervisory union for years, about a dozen years, in, in various ways, and that's how the Morristown Elmore merger voluntary merger came into play. So it would be a better uh, in, in our in the view of the of the district, that it would be a better way to um, to serve the students, and um, and we believe that our Section Nine proposal was the best way to meet and exceed the goals of Act Forty Six. So we had hoped for the you know this, but um, 
we'll move forward regardless. Again, we have we have two districts that are high performing that get along well, um, and we'll move forward regardless, and we'll make sure that we're ready in 2020. But in the meantime, we're hopeful that, again, for voter experience and other things, we're hopeful that it's delayed. Uh, when you say we are confident we will be ready in 2020, you're referring to the Stowe School District? Stowe and Morristown, yeah. More, e EMU, I'm sorry, yeah. Elmo Morristown Unified Union. Um, if, 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 yes, if, if we have to move forward, you know, we'll, we'll be ready regardless, you know, with however we. Are you confident that the uh, districts and communities represented by the various uh, signatories to your letter would be ready to go in 2020? Were they granted a one-year extension? I don't think I can answer that. I just don't know those districts, and I don't know. But I think if you if you ask uh, the, the representatives from that district, I think you'll find that uh, they will be uh, that they will be confident in their in their um, in their school districts and their, their uh, new uh, uh, however they're supposed to uh, organize restructure but uh, I couldn't answer that I would hope so obviously you know we're it's it's a law and we have to we have to do it um, we're right now and um, uh, it's just it, it's just a really it's a really tough thing to do again in our particular district I will just say that uh, there's a time frame um, and given um, the the confusion or the the miss it just it's it would it's going to be very difficult to educate the people of our district uh, uh, on all of these matters um, prior to votes that start happening. Um, so that's why. But. Just a question to make sure I understand what you're asking. Um, would all of the involuntary districts be granted this extension across the board, or would it be something that specific districts could ask for? Uh, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, so my piece of legislation, um, I think it's uh, again, it's uh, the the extension is H39. Yeah. Um, it is asking that all um, involuntary districts uh, be provided the extension to July 1, 2020, one year extension. Is there an option for them to continue to work on the paperwork on I I, you know, I think there's 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 all sorts of things that we can we can work on if if there's a. Um, you know, articles. The articles of agreement. I know uh, districts are considering now. I know uh, are certainly all of that is 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 happening at the same at, at this time. Even though there's again there's these legal cases and there's uh, this discussion happening. But but um, again, I know in our district we're moving forward the way we need to move forward. And um, but uh, but again, the uh, the request for the extension is uh, is important just to, uh, because it's a really really short time frame to be able to. Act. Educate and make sure people know uh, what what we're asking. And we recognize that you're presenting this concept, and we will hear from three um, stakeholders mm -hmm. regarding uh, those that would like to see a delay. We will also be hearing from those who would prefer not to have a delay. Representative Austin. Yes, you said um, that you'd be moving towards the merger regardless. Regardless of what. Well, I just I just said if we're going to be if if uh, so I I can't tell you for for sure what's going to happen with the court case with the legal case. Uh, but if that's decided and it's decided against the plaintiffs and our our case in particular, we're going to move forward with the merger as we need to move forward and we're moving forward right now because there is nothing in place right now that we, that allows us to. Uh, uh, to not do it um, as of July 1, 2019. So we're working very hard. There are meetings virtually weekly, uh, at least one with, um, so so we are moving forward right now. But again, um, I've been in this um, business a long time, been on the ballot, presented budgets uh, as a select board member and everything, and I will tell you that uh, the understanding of people in the community is paramount uh, when voting, and um, and that is not going to be, none of that is going to be clear for the votes that are gonna happen um, in just a few short weeks. Representative Tyler. And, and you'll uh, stop me, but. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, Act 46 was enacted in, in 2015, mm -hmm. four years ago. We've got two high-functioning districts that get along well together that are part of the same SU. Uh, how come it were in 2019 and there hasn't been any progress? Oh, there's been significant progress. Well, okay, so let me ask you, uh, why, why has it been hard to come up with a... Um, it's not been, actually. We, we've, we've, we did uh, every piece of work we were required to do in, in our analysis as a district and as, a, as two separate districts was that 
the best way to meet and in fact exceed the goals of Act 46 was the Section 9 proposal that was part of Act 46. It was not a waiver. Uh, there's no, you know, that is part of the law, and that's what we did, and we, and we proposed that, and we believe strongly that that is uh, the best way to meet the needs of our communities and our students, and the best ways, the way to meet the needs of Act 46, uh, meet the goals of Act 46, and it, we already do that, and I think, um, in, I think, I think you would find that if you, if, if, if there was an opportunity to read our Section 9 proposal. It's an excellent proposal um, and was approved, was recommended to be approved by the Secretary. And when you say our, so, you're talking about Stowe. Stowe, EMU. E well, don't for, forget Elmore Morristown. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a joint application. It was a joint application. Yeah, okay. yeah, EMU and Stowe. And it, I, I just, in the letter, um, I'm just curious about what this means. Uh, so the legislature will more fully understand the true implications of these mergers. Can you give an example of what you mean by that? So uh, I will say a constitutional and otherwise I I'll just point out that some of the legal some of the legal arguments being made by the attorneys and again these are not what we made clear in the letter these are these are the arguments being made they're not necessarily we, we just don't know enough about them as as legislators but for example in the in Act 46 it says specifically that the um, the preferred structures that mergers should happen uh, wherever necessary uh, but in the state plan the quote is that preferred structures um, uh, were um, were instituted wherever possible, so that's a pretty significant difference. Um, where necessary, where possible, um, is a pretty significant district so di uh, difference. So that's one of them. I think the debt issue with regard to um, uh, a community having the uh, being um, having the right to vote to incur debt, and in fact, incurring that debt, then that being fo that debt being foisted upon a community that did not have. Uh, a right to incur that debt, um, I think, is constitutional. I think th they argue, to, you know, violates equal protection clause um, and, a, and a common benefits clause of the Vermont Constitution, the equal benefits and, and uh, uh, the equal protection clause, and one other of the U.S. Constitution. So I think that's that's where the legislators will see. And again, I, like I said, I watch Law and Order a lot, but are before the court. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly, Actually, and that's what it was the other wise, not the constitutional issue that I was more interested in. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I think it's just a, for otherwise. In my in my in my opinion, for the otherwise, it's in fact um, when you have districts that um, can illustrate clearly uh, uh, that the best way um, to meet and exceed uh, the goals of Act Forty Six um, are being forced into a different organizational structure for, 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 for no reason. I think that's otherwise. I think that is one thing that we didn't anticipate as a, as a, as a legislative body. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, um, any questions or if, if there's other uh, ideas on how to, um, how to accomplish what, what we're, we're trying to get, go for, please um, feel free to reach out or anything I can do to bring the folks to the table as well. So. Thank you. And I understand there's some action happening in the courts on the 15th. Uh, uh, actually, there's there's a, um, if I'm not mistaken, there is a, uh, what do you call it when they get together? And status conference. Status conference today, I think. Today? I believe so. There's, uh, or sometime this week. Is that right? There? This yeah. So, so at least that's... Thank you again, and thank you for taking this up. I know it's, uh, I know it's a lot for the first <laughs> couple of weeks, but we really, really appreciate it and your interest in hearing. The newly formed committee is on the fast track. I like your uh, your new digs too. <laughs> Much more spacious. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Ron sends his regrets. He got stuck in Chicago because of the storm. Oh, yeah, he was supposed to be back two days ago. Yeah. yeah, so I'm speaking on behalf of both yeah, branches today. Okay, well, will you join us oh, up, sure. in the, up in the, in the yeah. chair? Sure. I'm pulling up your statement now. Yeah. Yeah, right? He's probably like partying it up somewhere. He was in California, so I don't know that he actually left. Oh, right. but, uh, that's not anybody that's having travel issues. We understand. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just see if I can reload this here for you. I'll try to do it. Yeah. And do you want to read off of this? Or? I can just look at my phone. Okay. That's good for you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Tabitha, I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us why you're here. Okay, I am Tabitha Fulmore. I am the Vermont Director of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I'm also the Rutland Area President. I'm a sixth generation Vermonter. I grew up here. I went to schools here in Vermont. So that is me. And I'm here today to testify about H3, the Ethnic Studies and um, Equity in Education, Equity in Schools um, bill. And it's really funny because Amanda called me and she's like, oh, will you testify? I'm like, yes, because I still have my testimony from last year that nobody got to hear. <laughs> so this is wonderful. I just had to update a couple things, so we're, we're good to go. Um, but before I start that this morning, I um, had the opportunity to go to Sharon Academy. Um, they invited me to come to talk about um, racial justice in Vermont and, and equity in general in schools and what they could do because that's kind of what they're interested in. And one of the things I actually asked them um, was if any of you have any statements you'd like me to read about why you think that this bill is so important, um, please send them to me. And um, just like a student would, two minutes ago, I got a, um, I don't even know who it is, I said you can tell me your name or not, uh, from a 10th grader. And so I want to read to you this 10th grader's um, testimony before I say anything of my own because I feel like their voices are the ones that are most important in all of this. So hello Tabitha, I'm a 10th grader at the Sharon Academy. Being a middle class white girl in Vermont, I feel so sheltered from the real world. Going into cities and more urban places, I, felt, I feel very uncultured because this school is almost completely white and the different cultures are not well represented. I think that ethnic studies and educational equity for students around Vermont is so important because as Vermonters and people in an, ur in an urban place, I'm guessing she meant rural, we do not get to experience the same diversity in cities on a first-hand basis, so learning about it second-hand is the next best option. There is so much internalized racism and prejudice that we are blind to until we begin to talk, and that can't occur without a safe space to do so. So that is a student from Sharon Academy um, who just shared with me her interest. So that being said, I'd like to say what I have to say. So there's a quote that I love by Adrienne Rich that goes, when those who have the power to name and socially construct reality choose not to see or hear you, when someone with the authority of a teacher, say, describes the world and you are not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium as if, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. It takes some strength of soul, and not just individual strength, but collective understanding to resist this void, this non-being into which you are thrust, and to stand up demanding to be seen and heard. I want you to remember that as I tell you these next few um, pieces. And these are all complaints that I've received in the last year and a half. A teacher makes her students lay on the ground close together so they can get a sense of what slavery was like. She tells the one black student in class, you go first because you're black. A student threatens to kill all the black kids at another school, and the school determines that it was just a joke. And the student is allowed to return to school the next day, while some parents of the students of color are afraid to send their kids to school because they found out through their children, rather than from school officials, that this had happened. When asked why things happened this way, the superintendent, uh, or why she didn't alert families to the threat, her response was, well, I can't do that because that would be racist. A teacher forces kids to repeatedly say the N-word while reading Huckleberry Finn, despite their protest and protest of other students in the class, including students of color. A black educator leaves because district administrators do not value their expertise as the longest standing member of their department and instead asks them to mentor uh, someone with, or ask someone with no license to mentor incoming people um, in their field and in their department, even though the black educator is highly regarded by the agency of education and other officials. A student is punished more harshly for the same infraction than co-conspirators of the same act. Uh, a black educator is passed over multiple times for a position, told that they don't have enough experience, only to see that same position go to an educator with no experience and no license. A black kindergartner is hit by a teacher for doing the same exact behavior as his classmates at the same exact time, 
The school covered it up, refused to investigate until the parents pushed the issue, and then brought the child into a room with the abuser, the principal, and other educators, and told him that it wasn't as bad as he, um, as he experienced it, and that he needs to apologize to the teacher. I could go on and on about the stories and experiences and complaints that I hear uh, on a regular basis in the Rutland area, but I know that these issues are not unique around Vermont. Um, in the last two years since we've been chartered, the Rutland Area Branch, we have received more complaints in the area of education than all other areas combined. Whether it's invisibility in the classroom, poor or no curricular representation, unfair and discriminatory labor practices, or unequal treatment as perpetrators or victims of a variety of infractions, Vermont students of color are not getting what they deserve, and neither of the, are the white children. I remember one day, one of my favorite students, this is when I actually worked at high school um, up until a year ago, uh, visited me after visiting a friend at Boston Children's Hospital. As she told me about her experience, she paused to say, Miss P, I was so scared uh, when I was there. Her eyes got really big with fear. I asked her why, and she replied, there were so many black people. So um, there's a few things wrong with that picture, but she, at no point did she stop and even think about what that would mean for our interaction. Here I am, the person she trusts the most. And she's telling me about how afraid she is of people that look like me. Um, this young woman loved and respected and trusted me. She was utterly afraid to even see people who looked different from her. No one spoke to her, no one accosted her, no one did anything at all except exist, and that was too much for her. Between lack of exposure in her life and lack of exposure in her education, this young woman could not even see someone different without being afraid. And this example is not unique. I don't think that we're gonna solve the problem of the lack of people of color in Vermont overnight, and yes, that is a problem. There are so many broken systems to repair that this particular endeavor will take far more time before large numbers of people of color, color even consider coming to our state as an option. But there is something we can do right now to help repair the education system. The State Board of Education could have already done something to remedy these issues, but they have not done nearly enough, and they have tried to do some things. But H3 is what is necessary to move this to the next level. We must do better. Students of color are facing the same exact struggle uh, to be reflected in their communities as I did when I left Vermont in 1996. And I left simply because I was not reflected anywhere. Uh, white students are still afraid of people of color, even though because of technology, our world is shrinking and we have more access to different people and cultures than, and ways of knowing and learning than ever before. Queer kids are suffering in silence and we know that the consistently validated reports about students with disabilities are quite alarming. And it's no coincidence that the people most often omitted from the curricula are also those most likely to fare poorly in our education system. If the old adage is true, that in order to know where you're going, you must first know where you have been, then we are certainly going nowhere fast without the inclusion of indigenous culture and history, as it is the backbone and the cradle for all that exists in our country today. If we are to be a successful people, we must be a well-educated people, and that education must be founded in the principle of equity, equity in treatment for students, equity in curriculum, and equity in representation at every level of our education system. While the third of these will certainly take longer for our state to catch up on, the other two can begin to be addressed by this critical piece of leg legislation. Failure to address this will undoubtedly, as history has proven, uphold the systems of supremacy that relegate thousands of Vermonters into silence and make all of our children vulnerable to ignorant, hateful, and racist ideology. And this is not what our children deserve. That's what I have to say. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> I have so many more. I didn't even tell any of my own. Yeah, and those are all in Vermont. Vermont. This is all Vermont schools. This is all Rutland area schools. Not one of those is outside my county. And that's maybe a third of the stories that I've uh, heard in the last two years with the NAACP. So as you look at the bills that, that we have, is there anything that you would change or add or subtract from the bill? Well, as a member of the coalition, Amanda and I have been working together, you know, as, as things come up and as we include more folks. But as of right now, I'm okay with where it stands. Um, we are looking at a clause or something specific to um, indigenous culture um, and inclusion because, again, that is the foundation of this society. And we must recognize, if we are to repair any harm, that original harm. So that's what we're looking at right now. That, that original harm is... Oh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how some of the issues you mentioned um, 
I, I see how they would be addressed in this bill in terms of, of having a, a development curriculum over time that, mm -hmm. that does <coughs> look at all the contributors to our society and also the, the episodes in history that, that we haven't looked at um, mm -hmm. within a technology view. Some of the other things that are about um, uh, bad behavior by administrators, mm -hmm. lack of accountability, lack of any kind of appropriate seeming sensitivity. Um, how will H3 prepare us for making the changes we need to make, be those right. statutory or otherwise? Well, I think that there are a few ways that it will help because I think as adults have to become more literate and more understanding and more agile in terms of cultural understanding and inclusion, that will hopefully change some of the mindsets or it's going to weed out the people that don't have an interest in, um, in this kind of image or this um, ideal um, of equity. Um, so that's one way that I think it will help. The other way is that it's going to create a generation of folks who get it better than we do. And those are going to be our next generation of educators. So as far as directly addressing some of the harms that were done, it's not. Those are done. Um, hopefully, you know, Human Rights Commission or Agency of Education, um, they're dealing with those issues um, from other perspectives. But it's going to be more tangential in H3. I wish we could improve this. One thing at a time. Uh, and I think you, you probably just uh, answered my question, but uh, in the stories that you told and actually some testimony we had earlier today, um, the issue of uh, cultural competency of teachers came up, and H3 really is about curriculum for students. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I don't want to complicate the bill any more than it needs to be, and I, that, that piece may be lacking, but it does. are there cultural competency efforts going on that you know of around the state? Oh, schools absolutely. Schools, schools are place? trying, but it's kind of like trying to put a Band-Aid on a, you know arm that's been cut off. It's just not working. I mean, Sharon Academy had me there this morning. They're doing wonderful work. They're much more progressive than a lot of institutions, and I know that they're an independent school, um, so they you know, kind of have different rules. But um, people are trying, but without this you know, um, systemic level of buy-in, um, it's really difficult to push against this, you know, hundreds of year old um, pedagogy. Yeah. Well, I, what my, I, it's the cultural competency of the oh. adults, not the kids. Oh, of the adults? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, people, people are trying, but they're trying the same old thing. Yeah. Some people are trying to do um, new and progressive things, and I really um, admire them for that. Um, but it's really hard to do when you're swimming upstream. So if we can all kind of agree that the stream needs to go this way, I think that they'll see more, um, more progress. Because what's happening, it's just like the kids, right? Um, you educate them here about this, and then they go back into the community um, where you know, the other is what they learn. So it's the same with adults. Are you aware of things like the bias training that's going on in your area? Mm -hmm. Are there examples of what schools that are including this implicit bias yes. training for staff? Uh, currently, Rutland, uh, the Rutland Area Superintendents Association, and I could be getting that name wrong, uh, I know Rutland City Schools is leading the effort with a new superintendent, Adam Taylor, to do an equity conference this spring, um, which is great. Wallingford Elementary School, which is where my kids attend, um, just did an implicit bias training uh, with um, See the Way. Um, and again, I think that these are good one-shot opportunities. Um, but without the underlying structure, one-shot deals are not going to do it. Um, it's kind of like a booster without the initial immunization. Have you seen any curriculum materials that gave you pause? Like positive pause? Well, I'm actually looking for well, positive would be great, but have you looked at curriculum materials that probably should have been tossed? Oh, God, yes. Absolutely. Um, as a school, like I said, um, I actually ended up uh, submitting a complaint um, on the behalf of students over a number of years um, about the Huckleberry Finn issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. we've, we've, un we've um, needlessly complicated that along with To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, literature tends to be the place where there's some things that were like, oh my god, what's happening here? And then the other one is social studies and Thanksgiving. Lord, I always, <laughs> I went into my kid's school last year. This is a my ME story. Um, and my daughter was in kindergarten, and she's just this bright, happy, you know, kid, just a kid. And she comes out, she's wearing her pilgrim hat, and she's like, Mom, look at me! And I'm like, oh, good Lord, what is going on?
going on here? And that was one of the reasons that we started doing more implicit bias training in our school. And it's not that people are trying to be jerks, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, in another situation, um, and this wasn't particularly curricular, I had a student who was queer and she was coming out and I was the first person she came out to. And um, her social studies teacher kept using some pretty homophobic terminology um, to connect with uh, another group of students who had been disenfranchised. Um, and she came to me and I went to the teacher and talked about it and the teacher was like, you know, you're right, I gotta, I gotta do something different. So two days later, the, the kid comes back to me, she's like, well, Miss P, I can tell you had the conversation. And I said, well, how can you tell? She goes, well, because when um, a kid said something homophobic in class, the teacher responded by saying, you know, the kids that say the most homo homophobic things are often the kids that are gay. <laughs> Like, that didn't work the way you wanted it to. Um, two years ago, uh, around Thanksgiving, um, a colleague posted, uh, because they were in charge of doing kind of like, um, was it TA? Um, like the homeroom curriculum for Thanksgiving, and just gave an article that said, hey, maybe there's another perspective about Thanksgiving. This is something you might want to talk about with your kids. And it was written from an indigenous point of view. <laughs> the social studies department freaked out. They absolutely flipped out. They're like, why would you ever put something like this out there? This doesn't celebrate the holiday. It's not what it's supposed to be about. And I was like, oh God. So yes, I got- There's an answer to that question. Yes, yes there was. My friend handled it wonderfully. But um, there are some people that are malicious and there are some people that just don't know. Um, and there are some people that are afraid. Thank you. Mm. Um, hi. hi. As a former teacher, I would spend hours looking for resources, for mm -hmm. books, you know, and trying from my perspective, you know, whatever I was teaching, you know, to find the best writers or the best artists or the mm -hmm. best music, you know, to integrate. Is there like either a national or regional curriculum so you look at them on standards and you make recommendations mm -hmm. that if you're in first grade, mm -hmm. you know, doing Thanksgiving or whatever, you know, this these would be, let's say, five of the books, or five mm -hmm. of the, you know, textbooks, or, you know, just a, 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 where a teacher could go, because it, you know, would take a lot of time for them to think they're getting the best right. book, but there may be a hundred books out there that are so that's much right. better. Right, and that's what's difficult, and I think that that's the difficulty in teaching in general, is, right, you pick your biology textbook, and you think it's going to give your kids the most comprehensive start to wherever they go next but then you find out that there's another textbook. So in that regard, it's similar. Um, and yes, there are tons of curricula out there. There are tons of different entities that are doing this work, and that's the whole point of H3, is so that we have that point of access here in Vermont, and we're not limiting teachers and saying, this is all you can teach, right. because that's not, that's not good. Right. Um, but at least saying, hey, you know, here are some ways that you could change things up. Yeah. Um, as far as your, as far, not even just curriculum, but just as far right. as um, the standards. Right. Um, so that those are more representative. But there's no entity that could maybe say, you know, there's been a committee of like a lot of input from a lot of different stakeholders, and these are the, you know, four books, you know, we think would be really great for, there's nothing out there. Well, there's, I mean, there's lots of different entities yeah. that claim to be the authority. I mean, right, yeah. so um, you might go to um, like PFLAG for resources on, you know, kids, um, uh, talking about you know uh, coming out yeah. or you might go to um, uh, my friend does this this uh, she has her own company called teaching well white um, so talking about teachers in their curricula there's you know there's plenty of uh, different resources around the nation again I wouldn't want to go to one singular right. source because then you're limiting but even a website you know that I mean I've never heard of that those two you know, so right. that I could go as a teacher. I, and yeah, I don't think we're ever going to find one. <laughs> like the single no, portal okay. of access for all diversity. I don't think that that will exist. I mean, it would be nice, it would be but um, it's, I don't okay. think it'll ever be a thing. But that's a great question. But I think that, there, I don't think it should be actually, because if you do that, then you're limiting perspective. And this bill isn't about limiting perspective, it's about expanding it and saying, you know, these are the basic ways that we need to be educating our kids. And here's different ways, places you can go to get that. Mm -hmm. um, but allowing people that you know, freedom that Vermont's known for. I think sometimes it's just about uh, curriculum in the areas of social studies or history and the fact that we have, uh, I completely agree, an incomplete, to say the least, um,
curriculum that has been that has been taught since, certainly since the time that I was in Vermont public schools, um, and and before, and I'm just thinking if if we've considered the ways in which it's that, of course there won't just be a portal for uh, all the information that we'll want to add into the system, but at the same time just knowing well there's a certain number of hours in the school day and right. days in a year and years in a mm -hmm. in a educational career for a student in Vermont. Um, that there will be some parts of our social studies and history that, that will need to be de-emphasized and will need to kind of, because we've sort of filled up a block, well, here's everything you need to learn, <laughs> you know? I know, right? And, and it leaves so much out, but as yeah. we incorporate other things in, it's not so much like, well, this is the definitive list. Yeah. It's we're teaching you how to view an uh, endlessly complex history through different lenses. And so it just occurs to me that that is a, it's a big shift. Because, you know, it also moves us away from a sort of rote memorization of history, right? A, a sort of list of things that you shall commit to, to memory. And I think that, um, I, I don't have any, any <laughs> big <laughs> conclusion here, just thinking about, thinking about that, that this isn't just expanding the list of topics in, in curricula over the years, it's really seems to be changing the way we're going to intend to learn, the way we're going to, kind of the skills for that lifelong learning and almost, and so, I, I don't know, it just, um, in that sense, it, it strikes me that it's a very exciting undertaking and also a very big undertaking because it's not simply saying, you know, we're going to pull out this 20% of the curriculum and replace it with this sort of diversified 20% that That's we all right. kind of agreed on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested to, and not that I'm looking for an answer here, but I will be interested to kind of hear how members of the state board mm. view that mm -hmm. challenge, how members of the NEA view that challenge, and, and some of the ways we might get there. It's it's a fascinating development. I think it's, it's such a great time to do this. I mean, we have Act 54 that's created that new executive director position that's going to be, you know, um, assessing the different entities. So I'm really excited about to see how that and H3 work together. Um, it is. I mean, we've sh shifted mindsets in education, right? It's not about rote memorization because the amount of information in the world doubles every two to six years depending on the field. Kids can't possibly memorize all that. So, we, you know, it's how to be thinkers. And this is about how to be good citizens. This is about how to be citizens that are mindful of others. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, too. I'm sitting here like, <laughs> this is not my classroom. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for, for sharing um, mm -hmm. this experience and for coming to the legislature today. It's very helpful. I actually grew up down in Wallingford, so I went to Wallingford Elementary School for my entire elementary education. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. I think you went with, yes. It might be. Um, <laughs> I think you and my younger brother went to school together. Very likely. So, yeah, you'll get some stories. Yes, um, yes. Uh, but I, I just wanted to ask, uh, specifically to the bill before us, there's a working group one of the members in different versions uh, that have uh, gone through the process um, included a representative of pre-K education. Yes. Do you think that the lens of uh, early education and pre-K is important or vital to this discussion oh, and the work absolutely. that will go on? It's probably the most critical of all because, right, the first five years are the formative years and what you do there is so important. And pre-K is what, three and four, five years? Yes, absolutely. I have strong feelings about that. Thank you. Very yeah, much. you're welcome. Very call helpful. me anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Well, call Amanda and she'll tell me to come up. Okay. Now, Sue wants more too. Good for you. I was able to squeeze in um, one more person to speak to us today about the executive director of racial equity position. So, um, Beth, can you join us? at one point about the work, who would do the work, um, who would be reviewing the state curriculum standards, um, and I'm speaking with the state board, and there was some question that, you know, that this, this bill puts it to the work group, and some, there was another one that had suggested that perhaps the executive director of age racial equity, which has yet to be hired, uh, should fill that position, and we wanted to just understand a little bit about that position, 
and if you thought this would be an appropriate role, or is there an appropriate role for that person? Yeah. Um, for the record, I'm Beth Pastigi, the Commissioner of Human Resources for the State of Vermont, and uh, we're talking about um, the new racial equity executive director that was um, enacted uh, last in the special section at Act 9, and uh, I just wanted to go over the view kind of where we were in that process and go over their duties. So um, how that person is going to be hired is through a panel, and it's a five-member member panel that is currently um, screening applicants and will be setting up interviews, I think, very soon. And once that happens, they'll be submitting um, recommendations to the governor. The new position will sit in the uh, Secretary of Administration office and be responsible for um, kind of a broad overview of state government in terms of racial equity. Um, so they will be primarily liaison between the Governor's Workforce <laughs> Equity and Diversity Council, the Human Rights Commission, and also the Cabinet. So that's one of their primary responsibilities and some of the job duties that that person will be doing. Kind of broad, but um, one of the things they'll be doing is looking at all the departments within state government, what they do kind of internally and how their internal operations are, but also the communities they're serving externally and start um, gathering data and collecting data so they can have something to measure and to see how we are actually doing in terms of racial equity. So that's kind of one of the first charges. Um, just, I've got a whole list of <laughs> the work that the person's going to be doing, so let me just kind of look it up from that Act 9. Um, so, just try to look on the page where it is. You don't, you're not that interested in the funding, probably. Um, <laughs> Appropriation funding, equity report, report. I'm just trying to find the duties in here because there was quite a big list of them. All right, I'm just going to have to go from my memory. But, but overall, I think that um, it's one of the nine of a special session. It's an Act Nine yeah. special session. One of the things that they're going to be doing is um, overseeing a comprehensive organizational review to identify systemic racism in each of the three branches of state government. Um, and inventory system is in place that engender racial disparities. Um, they're going to be managing and overseeing statewide collection of race-based data to determine the nature, uh, nature and the scope of racial discrimination within all systems of government, developing model fairness and diversity policies, and reviewing and making rec recommendations regarding fairness and diversity holiday, ho policies held by state government. Um, we're collaborating with all the agencies to gather data and and so they can make some determinations and have some information so people can evaluate that. Um, <coughs> developing performance targets um, for the General Assembly, the ju Judiciary, and the agencies within the executive branch. Um, and also um, getting some reporting information on that so the executive director can be tracking that. Um, we almost see this um, in part like we have the chief performance officer that's looking um, at state government from a data-centric view. Um, the plan actually is to have the new uh, executive director to be um, sitting right right near that, right near um, Sue Zeller, I don't know if you know Sue, but right in that same office area as her. So be kind of housed within the agency of administration. The agency of administrative will be, will be providing all the administrative, technical, legal support that the position needs. Um, also, they'll be um, working on conducting, developing uh, trainings with respect to uh, the nature and scope of systemic racism and also the institutionalized nature of racial bias. That's another um, job duty. Um, that's not necessarily going to take away um, from the existing training we do and will just hopefully enhance the existing training we're doing across state government. So just improving what we have, what we're offering and suggestions to make it better and hopefully this person will be able to do some training themselves um, in their spare time. <laughs> um, I think that's really about it, but it's very broad. 
broad duties. Um, I did not bring a copy of the job description, but it basically has the information, kind of an abbreviated information that's included in the um, in the statute. Um, I know they're uh, looking for someone who has um, definitely background in uh, issues of racial equity as well as some strong administrative and leadership experience, um, either in private sector or public sector. So that's kind of the scope of that work. Um, they're not hiring someone to be kind of a narrow focus on K through 12 education at all, so I'm not sure what this bill does or what the um, focus of this position would be. It would be definitely seems to be more narrow in a sense of kind of what you're probably talking about, something that's more, more single focus, but something that's really more, um, I don't know about more, but very, um, familiar with that educational system. It's not, it's something that would be helpful in the racial equity um, executive director, but not necessarily something that we, that the hiring panel has been zeroing in on as a technical expertise that they're actually looking for. What the current work group is to do is, is that uh, shall review the statewide curriculum standards adopted by the state board and recommend to the board updates and additional standards to recognize the full history uh, contributions and perspectives of ethnic groups and social groups and there are a bunch of things along there so so do you see that this person could be um, a valuable member as opposed to being the person that was responsible absolutely um, that's um, one of the things that the uh, statute does say is that person would be um, the racial equity executive director is going to be li liaison between other groups and um, the administration the governor's office so I don't see why that person couldn't do that as well, depending on how much time that was in there. Again, it's one full-time person, and the job duties are already pretty broad. Um, and it's, I think, um, depending on, um, I think there's going to be a lot of work for this person to do already, and I, I don't know that um, they would have the ability to take on this, uh, like an additional responsibility of the whole, I don't know what the percentage of job you're talking about, but certainly participate. I, I, it's an area of interest. Um, I don't, so this, well, this position is about state government and the agency of education, of course, if this is within the agency of education, that's within state government, so it would be something that that person would definitely have an interest in and be watching whether or not I would think they were a part of the working group or not, it would be something that they would definitely be following and keeping their eye on and looking for progress reports on from the Agency of Education. Thank you. Questions? Uh, wondering about this position. So we have the Executive Director of Racial Equity within Act 9 of the special session. It looks as though that will be implemented with technical assistance provided by the agency of administration. Yes. So the support of those activities, this executive director could potentially pull upon or draw upon the resources of the agency of administration. Is that correct? Yes. So I guess um, just something that I'm trying to think through as we look at this is um, the agency of education would presumably be providing technical support to the working group um, as it worked in the education realm. And so I would think that having the executive director on the working group might be helpful to draw upon additional resources, recognizing that we're still very much in the mm -hmm. realm of education, but I, I don't see anything negative about having them there. One other question would be that there was a previous discussion, I believe in a previous iteration of this prior to this session, in which um, it was thought that perhaps the executive director of racial equity uh, could provide the legal analysis or a review of statutes <laughs> to flag education related provisions that this working group might want to look at. Do you think that the executive director of racial equity would have the appropriate uh, legal and administrative um, know-how to actually do that review for the working group or might that be better accomplished um, by other stakeholders of the agency of education? I mean at this point I would say probably the other stakeholders at the agency of education. We don't know who that person is going to be so it's possible they might have that legal expertise but again, not knowing who the, you know, 
who, who will um, ultimately be the executive director of the can say you probably can ask that person in a couple of months because they'll be here and I'm sure that they'll be <laughs> a lot of committees will be very interested in hearing um, the how that work is going to happen and meeting the meeting the new person and we're pretty excited to uh, have have the executive director come on board but um, um, you know, until we get in place, and it's going to be a little bit of time before they get up to speed and can, can do that work. So, so possible, but it's hard to say without knowing the um, you know skills and expertise in the position. That wasn't that wasn't actually <coughs> what was laid out in Act Nine. So that that that's not part of it. So I don't think that's what the panel is really hiring for. If you get a person that can do all of these wonderful things, it's going to be amazing. So <laughs> we'll see. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yep. Just um, and I apologize, like my ignorance, or um, I've seen this uh, phrase, ethnic and social group. You know, social group. I can you define that for me? Cause I'm not sure what you're. Are you talking about something it's, that's in this bill? But I've seen yeah. it before yeah. in other bills, and I, I don't. I mean, I feel like we're all members of a social group, so I'm not. Yeah. I just need a definition. Probably, it's probably not appropriate to be um, asking that of Beth because she's not participating in it. Okay. There is a definition in the bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah. If you look there. And, and probably someone from the okay. agency of I, education certainly is yeah. much more familiar or will be familiar with the bill, and I'm, yeah. I expect we'll be No, it is in here. I just, I, I had started reading the bill, yeah. but I hadn't gotten through it. I apologize. I, I, no. I, I, and I did jump right in. I'm the Commissioner of Human Resources, so my department we have, I'm yeah, not yeah. normally in this committee, I'm in, we're in government operations. We have about 100 people and we do the whole gamut of, uh, from recruitment to payroll to uh, labor relations um, to employee classification and compensation, um, so employee this is, health benefits. Yeah, this is fine. Yeah. I just haven't gotten to this part yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very Thanks. much for thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. important questions yeah. for us. So um, we are going to do our mental gymnastics. And we're going to take everything about A3, put it aside, and we're going to turn on our brains for our merger discussion. Thank you. And I believe, um, Shannon, are we doing this by phone? We have two folks by phone, and Scott Thompson is the person. You're Scott Thompson. I am. Okay, good. <laughs> So, um, so we, I'm working on getting um, Daniela have on board, and Sorkin getting Penny. These, these people are, you know, maybe we should just take Scott first. Are you not all going to see that? No. No. Oh, great. Okay, that was your great So, um, <coughs> what, what we're going to be talking about now, um, thank you, Thanks. we heard um, <coughs> Representative Sherman's uh, introduction of the possibility of a delay. We are going to hear from three people. I'm sorry, I've limited it to only three people so that we can at least get an idea of what, we're, what the, the landscape is. Um, who are stakeholders in the process who will speak to us uh, regarding the value of a delay, okay? And, I, and um, I'm going to invite Mr. Thompson here, who's a school board member for U32. And I would like to uh, remind you that our focus is really on a very narrow question. It's only on, does delay help you? Does delay hurt you? And we're not going to be getting into the, you know, and the merits of Act 46, the merits of your argument. That's all in the court. Okay. You're all about time. <laughs> That's what we're talking that about. That rule applies to the rest of us, too. <laughs> yes, it applies to the rest of us as well. So we're going to have three different people um, joining us, and, and we'll start with, with Scott first because you happen to be here. The virtue of presence. Yeah. Um, my name is Scott Thompson. I am the Callis representative on the U32 Middle and High School Board. And um, full disclosure, I'm also an individual plaintiff in the Athens et al. v. State Board appeal um, against the November 30 decision. I'm in favor of the one year delay. Um, for basically two big reasons. One is that at present, uh, at least 
among our boards in Washington Central, it's, it's bedlam out there. We have essentially a level of confusion and bureaucratic gamesmanship, the two of them seemingly feeding off each other, which is dizzying. And as a result, we, um, nobody is really sure which law applies. Does, um, does this, are we subject to the, to the order of the State Board of Education that forces us to merge? Um, even though none of those institutions, the Transition Board um, in the first instance has been created yet. Uh, or are we subject to the law now in force, which would require us to submit the budgets in time for town meeting. So what's happening is that <clears throat> boards are engaged in kind of pitched battles among themselves, and sometimes, well, with the superintendent as well, uh, who is essentially representing the agency's view of the matter. And um, a number of boards in Washington Central, uh, or at least a, a number, yeah, one is a number, right, um, uh, that I know of has decided to, has voted to warn the single school budget. So the virtue of a, of a year-long delay would be just to bring some order to this mess um, and to allow our, our schools and our boards to function in, a, in an environment that is at least somewhat stable and predictable. Um, the second big reason why I think the year delay is um, not only important but necessary is for you. Because even if the, um, you do vote a year delay, that does not clean your plate of Act 46 business by any means. There are still many issues which, as you mentioned at the beginning, Madam Chair, um, I, I'm not going to get into in detail. Um, however, I think you're very aware of them. And the key point of this is that forcing mergers has taken us into entirely new territory. This is very different from what you saw with the, um, with the voluntary mergers. There, it's almost as though, you know, it's a different quadrant on the coordinate system where signs flip to negative and what was okay in one context is no longer okay. And just if you consider that, <clears throat> I mean, the state basically holds all the high cards. I mean, money, staff, centralized command and control, prestige, constitutional authority, and yet this sort of ragtag bunch of school board members and school boards and some select boards have filed a very sophisticated appeal that has led to the Attorney General putting agreeing to put a hold of five weeks and um, has also led the state to request the um, disqualification of the judge that was assigned. The state, I think, the executive side, sees that this is different, this is new. There's a lot here that needs taken, taken care of. And this year would give you the chance to really look at that in a deliberate way and be able to take care of it. was enacted in 2015, four years ago. The first school districts that did it in the preferred model um, were operational by 2017. If you had, and I'm, uh, your district hasn't, even, hasn't doesn't even have articles of agreement, hasn't, hasn't been through the 706B process. Correct? We have. We went through the 706B and found it inadvisable. Okay, so you don't have articles of agreement. No. So what, I'm just trying to get clarified. What good is a, a year going to do if you haven't been able to even cross an article? Ah, thank you. Um, 
this is where I can clear up a possible misconception. Um, I've, I've heard it said that uh, an extra year would allow you know, these non-compliant um, districts to get their act together. What you have to realize is that we have our act together totally. Um, and what we came to is that the blasted thing doesn't work. And there's no way to get around it. We tried everything, two years. Um, again, I'm avoiding the issues, the, the big blocking issues. But um, we know to a T, and we demonstrated you know, with um, as clearly as we were capable of doing why a merged district would not meet the goals of Act 46. And um, that's why I'm, I'm saying that um, this, this is not going to change that situation at all. Um, this is why there's still all this stuff on, on this committee's plate. It's not going to change what situation? Um, the, it's not going to change the situation within Washington Central, the, the barriers to merger within our supervisory unit. Um, it will, however, give the, um, the legislature a chance to maybe look at them and make whatever modifications are necessary. Uh, thanks for being back, Scott. I remember you, you worked for the Foreign Service, is that's that right? right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate the diplomacy you're bringing to the conversation today. Um, do you recall that? I guess my question would be, um, we just heard testimony from someone else in favor of a year extension who suggested that in her district, she was confident resolution would be reached for their district. Am I hearing you say there will be no resolution, even with a year-long extension, short of the legislature taking action to modify the law as it now stands? Correct. Thank you. And I think this, um, can you just expand on the barriers that you're talking about? Sure. Um, the, I, I'll, I'll just mention one um, very quickly because it's the um, it's sort of like proficiency-based government. If you can't get this one right, then what can we get right? Um, and that's debt, the distribution, the redistribution of debt in a merged system. Is that it? Is that when you said there are uh, there, there are others, but um, but that has been the the kind of the um, the linchpin. That's the headline. Or Washington Central. Of course, you know that today's district without debt is tomorrow's district that needs a new roof. Ah, that is a quotation from the Secretary's plan. And I, um, I know you, however, it, it actually is not true. Um, Calus Elementary, for example, has a capital plan that goes out to 2090 and that actually plans for capital. Um, replacement, refurbishing, so that the new roof is already covered, it's paid for ahead of time, and built into the capital budget for the, the scheduled need, so that we are thus able to avoid having to bond. And that was a state employee who came up with that, by the way. Thank you. We will be um, listening to, to your testimony, um, to others with that point of view, and then we will be listening to those who, who disagree with you. Very good. I would be disappointed if it were any other one. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you.
Danielle, can you hear us? I can. Great. Okay, Danielle, thank you I'm for, for calling. I'm going to have the committee members introduce themselves here. Um, starting with Batista. Hi, Danielle. This is uh, Representative Dylan Gian Batista from Essex Junction. Hello, this is Representative Caleb Elder from Starksboro. Yes, this is Sarita Austin from Colchester. Chris Maddows, Milton. Larry Cooperly, Rutland City. Kate Webb, I'm the chair from Shelburne. Peter Conlon from Cornwall. Kathleen James from Manchester. Jay Hooper, Randolph. And Casey Tooth, St. Albans. And we have one member out today. Um, so, Danielle, we are interested in hearing from you on a very narrow question. We're keeping the question narrow. Um, okay. Should we uh, extend um, the timeline for a year? Uh, and if so, how does it help you or hurt you? We're, I'm going to have to refrain from getting into the merits of Act 46 and that process. But simply, uh, why do you want this? Why do you want this, this time change? Um, how does it affect your your school? Okay. Um, and you could also, sorry, so, introduce um, just yourself. Just for the record, so everybody knows, my name is Danielle Forty. I am a board member at the Newberry Elementary School um, in. Um, Newberry, Vermont, which is part of the Orange East Supervisory District. Um, and so um, what I would like to address a little bit here is um, it came to our attention really full center last week during an Orange East Supervisory Union meeting that um, our central, uh, central office is struggling under the mandated rollout of the new um, financial software that, um, that's being implemented. And so our superintendent spoke to us about what's going on with that rollout and um, her concerns and how those concerns would affect us. So um, one of the things that we've been told is that there is concerns about the ability to prepare um, accurate budgets using the system. And so our um, superintendent has uh, decided that they will run parallel systems. So they will use the old system and this new system in order to prepare the budgets going forward. Um, so at the same time that these budgets are being prepared on two systems, we're also trying to create a new merged board and prepare the first ever merged district budget. Um, so there's obviously concerns about that extra work, the extra stress that's being put on our central office um, and their ability to perform this work um, accurately. And um, once it's completed, then the board has the, the job of going through that budget and creating and making sure that it's been reviewed and um, vetted to make sure that it's you know, responsibly prepared. Um, one of the, well, you know, the, the goals of Act 46 are to provide equity, maximize operational efficiencies, and promote transparency and accountability. It's not really feasible for the board to go after this budget with those ideas in mind in this short of a budget cycle. So it's frustrating for me to have put in as much time and effort as I have into the Act 46 process and get to this point and not really be able to sit down and go through this budget and put it together, keeping in mind the focus of Act 46 and being able to bring that back to my voters and say, I am very happy with this budget. We were able to work towards the goals of Act 46. We were able to really streamline this budget and put together what we think is really a great outcome for our students in this area, taking into account the, um, the goals of Act 46 and equality and efficiency. Um, and the biggest thing for our district and our area is the accountability and um, transparency. We've struggled with having budgetary errors. Um, just recently, OSCO's budget was, it was, um, it came to light that there were some budgeting errors made by previous administrations, so that shakes the, the voters' confidence. Um, and so it, our concern is that if we rush 
to get this through at the same time that we're trying to implement a new software product, it, it will damage our new administration. Um, so we have a new superintendent, we have a new assistant superintendent, and we also have a new business manager. So all of these things combined, it, 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 uh, it's nerve-wracking that we could end up with a failed budget um, and for reasons that are not really in our control. Um, so what I would really like is for there to be this extended time frame to allow the administration to put together a budget not under the cloud of a new software for us as a new board, um, transitional board, to be able to go through it and really work together and come up with what is the most um, efficient budget to put forward, what equalizes, gives all the students equal opportunity, really have those conversations. Um, and, you know, we as a community are struggling with that trust piece in our central office, and I feel that the danger of a mistake or an error in the budgeting process or this um, merge timeline um, would really jeopardize the progress that we've made um, and, and this new administration is putting in so much work and it would be so demoralizing for them and us as board members to not be able to take forward um, a, an accurate and responsible budget. Thank you. Questions? Representative Connell. So, Speaking from some personal experience, when we went through um, a merger in our district, really, uh, and we were doing it under the accelerated model, which meant that we were under a tight timeline as well, we essentially took what would have been a bunch of existing budgets and just put them together as one document and saw that really as one step toward the goal of having a budget that produced equity and efficiency, which frankly, we've been at it now for three years and, and we're not there yet. Um, it's a long, ongoing process. But had you, had you given any thought to just simply uh, rolling up the existing budgets, combining them and calling that a, a unified budget as a first step toward having a, a unified district? Yeah, yeah, and in fact, that's pretty much what our, our thought process is. Um, but I, even if we do that, it will be, in my opinion, it's, it's not a fair representation to our voters. You know, you know even if you, I, I guess I have a hard time accepting that that's really moving forward, because I mean, I think, yes, we could do that in theory, but even that bit is, um, it, it seems to me, to sort of defeat the purpose. Um, I mean, certainly it could be done that way, um, but I think that even that in this time frame that we're looking at is, is, is a rough sell. I think that we still need to have some conversations about those line items and, and being able to even get to that point. Thank you. Representative Elder. Uh, yes, I am just curious. We've heard from a, a couple different um, folks in different school districts in one case kind of heard that this year extension would facilitate kind of completion of the merging process in another case that this one year extension wouldn't make any difference that there's no no intention or, or perceived ability to merge uh, where does where does your school district fit into that can you can you give give us a sense of is this extension really uh, providing an opportunity to complete a merger process and and accomplish more of the things you're talking about with Act 46's goals, or or is this sort of just a pause button while we wait for other other things to settle out? I'm sorry if that question's not clear. I'm just um, no, it's perfectly clear. No, absolutely. Um, so it's interesting that you asked that question because today when I was sort of going through, um, you know, just preparing myself for this. I actually went back and read his notes, and um, we as a district, when we went to our presentation to the State Board of Ed, all of the schools in our district agreed to merge if we could have an extended timeline, because we knew, we saw the amount of work that needed to be done, both you know, structurally to our FU um, software upgrades, 
um, different things that needed to happen that we just knew people-wise. We just didn't have the manpower to get it done. So we all understood that a merge was coming and we were working towards that, but we felt trying to get it done by July 1 was just, it was too much, too fast, and that we are all willing to merge and we are definitely working towards that merge. I do think this extra time would give us um, more time for the merge conversations to happen and for it to happen in a way that involves the community in a very healthy, full way instead of um, it's been somewhat bruising in the history in the past. So this would be a, a positive for us, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, if you weren't working on this, what would you be working on instead? If we weren't working on merging? Yes. Um, I actually think what we would be working on is um, we have a team of new, a couple new principals and um, this new, our new superintendent, and the goal has been to come up with a, a vision, and they've worked on that, and they've come through um, from their admin meetings on that, and I believe that we would be more focused on that, how we as schools would be working towards a unified vision. I think that this was going to happen anyways. I think our district was moving in that that, that direction anyways. Um, but it would be in a, a slightly different time frame. Thank you. Any, mm -hmm. other, any other questions? Thank you very much, Danielle. We appreciate your testimony. You're very welcome, and again, thank you for allowing me to provide testimony via phone. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all of your work. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Penny Jones. Anyone else out? <coughs> I'm sorry, Nicole. Can you believe that we're running late? We're only five minutes It's the first time. First time ever. Um. Yes, and is Newberry part of the lawsuit? Newberry? Yes. It is. Yes. Yes, yes. We were looking mainly to get testimony from those who are in the post mergers. Okay. But that's true, not all of them are in the Oh, I don't know about that. Yep. Oh, there you are. That's, that's much better. Hello? Uh, hi, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Are we muted or something? No. Hi. Can you, can, you, can you hear us? Um, I, something happened. I can just barely faintly hear you. Okay. Well, we, I, I'm a former teacher. I can speak quite loud okay. when I need to. Um, so I'm going to first have the uh, committee introduce themselves. I'm Kate Webb from Shelburne. I'm the chair. Hi, Penny. This is Dylan Giambattista. I'm a state representative from Essex Junction. Caleb Elder from Starksboro. Sarita Austin from Colchester. Chris Maddows, Milton. Larry Cooperly, Rotten City. Peter Conlon from Cornwall. <coughs> Kathleen James, Manchester. Jay Hooper, Randolph. Casey Toof, St. Albans. Did, could you hear that? I could. I think I heard everyone. Thank you. All right. Very good. Okay. Could you introduce yourself for the record? And, and we also just wanted, I'm sorry, I've said this a few times now, but not everybody's heard it, that uh, we're asking you to stay very narrowly focused on one thing. And that is the effect of a, a one-year delay. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to have you refrain from conversation about the merits of Act 46, you know, that, that business, whether we, you know, what your lawsuit is about, and, and to keep yourself focused on should we delay or not, and why. Okay, excuse me, thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Penny Jones. I am the Vice Chair of the Elmore Morristown Unified Union Board. I am a representative from Elmore, one of two representatives sitting on the EMU board. Today, however, I am speaking to you on behalf of the Loyal South Supervisory Union, urging you to um, provide a delay for the implementation to those districts that have been asked to merge or forced to merge. 
I do want to thank you for considering the delay and also the, allowing me the opportunity to speak to you um, regarding this. As you may know, LSSU went through a voluntary merger process when Elmore and Morristown merged. We understand firsthand that the merger process is a very challenging process. It took a lot of time for us to ensure the outcome would be the best um, to serve our students, support the teachers, and to properly communicate and engage with the community. And, and finally, restructuring the, the restructuring process itself. During the work that we did and the studies that we did on this merger, we did learn that the best environment to educate our students is the structure we're currently operating in. Um, currently, right now, we are pursuing both the parallel pathway, um, preparing for the operations in our current situation for fiscal year 20, and working toward um, what a forced merger would look like. The parallel processes are very confusing and frustrating to our communities. A delay would allow time to plan for merged operations in ways that include clear communications, thoughtful plans, and community engagement while the legal questions are resolved. We feel the status quo is the structure that provides the best educational environment for students throughout LSSU. A delay provides a more manageable and realistic timeline and allows time for the courts to do their work. The current forced merger timeline is unmanageable from a logistical standpoint. And again, the delay would allow us to take a step back and move forward thoughtfully in the best interest of the students, teachers, and entire, entire LSSU community. Again, LSSU does urge the legislature to provide um, those districts that have been ordered to merge by July 1 a delay. And, and, implementation until July 1, 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I don't mean to be silent on this one, but uh, since there, we've really heard the same supervisory union twice, my questions were, were already answered. Yes, <laughs> we, we had, we had uh, your representative in here that did a very good job uh, expanding on, on your view. Yeah, I, I understood yeah. that she spoke earlier. Uh, did you have any questions, I guess, specifically regarding um, the process, process that may have, that we may have to go through or what we did go through when we merged Elmore and Morristown? Actually, I, I would, I would, this is Peter Common, and I will ask, um, when your supervisory union, you know, uh, when Act 46 was first enacted, why did you go um, with two separate districts and not a unified district? Okay, so let me just first, I mean, back up. What we, when it was first enacted, Elmore and Morristown were already in the mix of That's right, yeah. merging. So we, the Elmore Morristown board basically said we want to stay on this path and we want to see this path through before we try to bring in another school district. But during the studies that we did have with the merger for Elmore and Morristown, we did look into that initially, and, and again found that the path that we were going on was the best path for all of our students. What was the size? What's the size of Elmore and Morristown? So, uh, Elmore is around 125 students, and I believe Morristown is in the 700 plus range. Or, I know the combined is just under the 900. So yeah, that sounds about right. Um, or like 798, as far as students. I'm going to ask a question that I asked of the last person. Um, if this were settled and you were merged, what would you be working on now? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? If this, were, if this question were not before you, whether or not to merge, what would you be working on? Let's, let's, say, you're, let's say you're merged. What would you be working on instead? If we did merge? Yeah. Um, we would in the short term we would be working on trying to get that merger process um, set up as far as like you know organizational setting up the district itself the new the new unified union um, working on the organizational meetings which we did already have working on articles of agreement getting a combined budget working on I, I, is that what you're asking I'm not sure I totally understand the question and so. once that was through where would, what, what would you like to be working on other than Act 46? Um, of course, the students trying to um, get the educational um, needs of the students met and making sure we're providing them the best education we can. 
Um, so I feel you are basically saying that, um, as I can hear it, that the consolidation that's already happened within your districts is enough in, in, in the view, well, in your view, and that further merging would not be desired or, or, or necessary. Um, is that accurate, first of all? Do I have that right? That, that basically this extension is not something you're asking for in order to complete a merging process. This, is that correct? Well, again, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm fully understanding the question, but let me just say this. The extension itself is a request so that we can delay setting up the unified union the best way we can. Again, having past experience with setting up the Elmore Morristown Unified Union, we know there's a lot of work to do. It, we spent over two years working on the articles of agreement, having community engagement meetings. What we did in two years, we're trying to, we're being asked to do in like um, what was November, so two months, three months, and then trying to wrap stuff up by July 1. So first of all, so for the delay itself is so that we can, I mean, if we're going to stay merged, and regardless of what the courts say, we need to go about this in a thoughtful path. And having just a short time to do that is, is not the best for the students, for the teachers, for the entire community. Thank, and I'll, just a quick follow-up, because I know that wasn't terribly clear, um, and thank you for answering it anyway. Um, my, I, I guess what I'm really kind of wondering is, will you use this year to do that work you're describing of, uni uh, of the further unification, which I understand does take time, or would you use this year to wait and see what the courts are going to decide? Uh, well, we haven't fully discussed that. My assumption would be we would be doing both. Um, we would continue to move along a, at a little slower pace on the path that we need to go in a merged unified union. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's how we would go. But again, going through the entire study um, and the possibility, you know, we decided, um, and I think proven that, you know, the for us, the best course is to say two separate districts. I know you want, don't necessarily want to hear about that now, but that's, I mean, we will always continue to work together with the two school districts side by side. Thank you. Representative Austin. Yes, you said that the, um, you know, that the current structure is, is what's best for your students. Um, if you were, let's say, uh, forced to merge, how would that be a negative impact? In specific, like, can you give me specific well, I think examples? One, yeah, one, one very specific example is the pending capital needs of both school districts. We have, and, and I don't know specific for Stowe, I know that they've been throwing out a 20 to $25 million um, capital bond that they may need and Morristown, the Elmore Morristown is a, in the neighborhood of 10 to 14. Um, I feel like having one merged board trying to decide how we're going to handle that and then the potential for the communities to vote such a large combined bond down that that's going to ultimately impact uh, the students of both districts. Representative Giambattista. Hi, Penny. This is Dylan Giambattista from Essex Junction. Um, I hate to use hypotheticals, but let's say that in one year, say that we extend the deadline by a year, and in one year we're in the same position, and whatever comes of the court decisions, it does not change your situation. At that time, would you be inclined to advocate for an additional extension? So it's... If you're saying that the courts have not made their decision in one year, um, Penny, if the courts decided and it was not a favorable decision for what you are hoping the outcome will be, would you then advocate for more time? I, I believe the answer would be no. At that point, you know, we're we're letting the courts handle this right now. Where we've asked for, um, you know, we've got the lawsuit pending. 
again, the delay, the biggest part of this delay is the fact that we need time to put through a thorough and thoughtful merged district. And, you know, again, the Articles of Agreement, we had an organizational meeting the other night, last week, and our communities are so confused by the fact that, you know, we're voting on a merged district and voting on behalf of a merged district, but yet we have this lawsuit pending. So it's just, we haven't had the proper amount of time to communicate to our communities as to how we're moving forward and how this is going to be the best um, path for everyone. Let me ask you this. Would it make a difference if you were required to get everything done other than the budget, other than the actual operation, uh, being operational? You had to get all of your, your paperwork done. Are you saying would that be unrealistic? It's, I mean, obviously we could get it done, but would it be in the right, um, would we be doing a, a disservice to our community? Yeah, I believe so. We're going in for a vote on February 26th, or that's the proposal, for um, the board structure and some school closings and the school of choice for students. And again, these are major important votes that we need to have, have our communities have. And again, we don't have the ability or the time to communi properly communicate to them as to what they're doing. So how much time do you think? What I'm saying is the community needs to make decisions of a future district that we really don't have time to properly communicate to them. How much time do you need? Um, given the Elmore Morristown merger that we had at least a good nine months to a year to really engage with our community, I mean, I think we're looking at that same amount of time to really have the thoughtful, engaging um, meetings with our, with our community. Any other questions? Penny, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you um, taking the out, letting the opportunity, letting me speak to you folks. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, everybody, change your hats. <laughs> We're moving from 46 to 83. Only to do the best human education. This is a contribution from Essex Junction. The best bananas in the world. Okay. Great. I know. I think these right. are real Essex Junction bananas. They are up for grabs. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Picture on the right top. Yeah. Trust yeah. me. You know. Trust me. 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 How's the film? How's it coming? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Best shot. I hope so. I hope so. Acting, uh, mayor, right? Not yet. We're almost called the president. Uh, no, uh, one week. One week until I'm still the deputy. It's exciting. Yeah. You need for a while break? Yeah. You see, it's going to get longer. They're serving the deputy. I'm sorry. We have Nicole and then we have the secretary. Um, I think it would be great to have that one. Secretary, would it be okay if they took a five-minute break between? Yeah, okay. I, I just don't seem to have a committee. Okay, so may I Is it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> to speak to you about that. <laughs> 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 I took some away. I will take a break. I will take, well, maybe they're taking a break now. I'll be right back. Quick, okay. oh, um, quick break. Two minutes? Yeah. I can go round them up. Why don't, or why don't we take a five now. minute? It looks like it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, to go with the flow and say we'll take a five, five minute break. Thank okay, you. Sorry. Five, I will let everyone know. Sits on my lap. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. H3. Shifting gears. Yes. For the record, my name is Nicole Mace. I'm the executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on H3. Um, 
was uh, had the opportunity last year to work with um, folks from the Agency of Education and the coalition on the draft bill that I think um, was reintroduced uh, this session. Um, so <coughs> we've been engaged in this conversation and appreciate <coughs> the opportunity to participate uh, um, this session. I want to spend a little bit of time um, sharing with you some work that our association has done with respect to um, racial justice and um, <coughs> social equity in schools. Um, a lot of our work is done in uh, partnership with the Vermont Superintendents Association, including in 2012, we launched a policy platform that we call the Agenda for World Class Education. Um, and we saw a lot of progress um, as a result of that shared um, agenda for public education at the state policy level. So our support for universal access to pre-K, support for proficiency-based graduation requirements, um, flexible pathways, and governance reform and, and education leadership supports um, were sort of implemented at the state policy level. But our, so our next sort of area of focus is how do we ensure effective implementation of these state initiatives? Um, at the local level, and that's happening in an equitable manner. We're not exacerbating um, differences between between districts. Um, and so, before the retreat could really, so we held the retreat with our leaders of our associations, um, tech center directors, principals, um, folks from the agency of education, to really unpack um, why we might see some inequities uh, in terms of implementation of, of, of our agenda. Um, and so we spent the first, it was a two-day retreat, we spent the first day really focusing on unpacking the ways that structural inequities um, form in our system through the intersection of individual biases, institutional practices, and formal policies. Um, so we designed the first day to help our attendees both identify um, examples of where these um, structural inequities are forming within the public education system. Um, and then we also focused on developing a working definition of equity because I think equity is a term that gets thrown around a lot without uh, necessarily a shared um, understanding of what we mean when we say um, equity. And so um, that was sort of a big outcome of the day, and we, our both organizations have adopted this working definition, um, which is listed in my testimony, which is on your website. So I'm not going to necessarily um, read it to you, but it's been really an important step forward for our association's work in developing resources and programming related to equity for our members. Um, our annual conference this year was um, dedicated to um, helping uh, district leaders design for equity and opportunity. That was the theme of the conference. We had keynotes and workshops associated with restorative justices, justice practices, um, youth voice uh, in terms of identifying, you know, we, we had showcased the work that's happening in the school districts around the state where youth are really leading the charge um, to address some of the um, racial and social justice issues that we see in our schools. Um, so we have also, uh, in addition to our conference programming and workshops, we've been working with VISBIT, which is the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust, uh, on a model policy on district equity. So the School Board's Insurance Trust is our partner um, for the model policy work that we do. I don't know that I sh uh, highlighted that piece of work when I was here last week in terms of the association, but we develop model district policies um, for school boards to consider. Um, Visbit, in our view, has significant expertise on the current legal and policy framework for addressing many of the issues that have been raised in H3. Um, their attorney, Heather Lynn, um, provides a lot of training to school district um, principals, superintendents, um, teachers uh, around how to implement uh, our state's hazing, harassment, and bullying um, policy and procedures. Um, and so we really rely on them in terms of once we start to get into um, uh, student behavior, manifestations of behavior that impact um, student well-being, uh, they are an important partner for us in that, in that effort. Uh, so I also urge you to hear from them. I know they do have an interest in, in, in this bill and, um, they, and potentially serving on the advisory group given that the scope of that work includes a review of the policies and statutes that relate to a lot of the issues that they, they have an interest in. 
Um, with that all as a background, um, the VSBA uh, believes that the ethnic and social equity studies standards called for by the bill are important uh, and require the support and oversight of the Agency of Education and State Board. Our understanding is that the agency and state board have relied on the work of national organizations with expertise in standards and curriculum when they've made recent updates to Vermont standards on science, technology, engineering, and math. I know the state board last week was looking at foreign language standards. So a lot of, there's been a lot of work related to updating Vermont standards, but the, that work has relied on the expertise and work product, frankly, of national um, organizations that have developed these content standards that are aligned with um, the Common Core state standards, et cetera. Um, science standards are similar. Um, so we would hope that similar resources could be brought to bear to this work. I don't know whether there is national work. I know, I believe it's the state of Washington went first with this type of, of work, but I think it's important to bring some um, support, um, and, and so we are not necessarily recreating the wheel um, in Vermont um, and applying this lens to some of the national standards that have been developed. Um, we want to strongly encourage the committee, I know you're hearing from folks at the agency shortly, um, but hear from them regarding the resources that they would need to support this effort. Um, we are concerned about the current state of vacancies at the agency and believe that before new initiatives are added to their plate, the committee should understand exactly who will take responsibility for supporting the work of the advisory group and the State Board of Education that is envisioned in this bill. Um, that's a real um, uh, area of, I think, focus. And to the extent we have reservations about moving forward with this bill, it's that without sufficient staffing support um, and technical expertise provided to the work group um, and the state board um, that that this process could um, not be as productive uh, as it should be. Um, and we've got examples of that in a host of task force and work groups, including the hazing, harassment, and bullying work group, which I was part of and the BSBA has a seat on, which has not been given any staff or resources, and I believe it's uh, ability to produce useful recommendations and guidance has been limited because of that. Um, I do want to call your attention to on page eight of the bill. There's um, uh, um, the work group is tasked with making recommendations with respect to school curriculum. Um, I'm on page eight of H three. Or oh, maybe I'm on a different, I'm on the bill as introduced. Um, so that the working group has to review existing state statutes regarding school policies and recommends proposed statutory changes that, and then ensuring school curriculum does this, that. So I just want to um, be clear uh, that it's important that the working group understands that the authority to establish in this committee that the authority to establish curriculum and graduation standards is currently held by supervisory union or district boards. Um, there's some um, guidance to those boards through the state board rule, um, and I cite cite the rules that you should look at if you're interested um, here. Uh, but state statute clearly places curriculum into the purview of supervisory union and supervisory district boards. If the state is going to mandate specific curriculum as a result of the work of this group, that will open up a much larger conversation about the roles of school officials in establishing curriculum. So I just want to flag that for you. I think it's important to manage expectations um, in terms of what this work group is going to produce. If we want to move to a statewide curriculum, that's a, that's a different conversation entirely. Do you see in the language that we have here that that's a, there's a problem in the language here? I think that this that? language contemplates statutory changes that ensure curriculum has certain pieces. And so I think you'd want to review what's in state board rule currently mm -hmm. and um, see whether changes to state board rule need to be made to reflect these. Um, aspirations, um, but understand at the end of the day, it is the school district's responsibility 
for adopting a curriculum, et cetera. So just want to be, we, we were in here last week talking about roles and responsibilities. Right. Want to just flag that for I you. I think that that's important to the committee as well, that we're not writing curriculum. And I've heard the state board uh, chair uh, share that concern that, you know, the state board does not write curriculum yeah. either. Um, so I just want to make sure that there's nothing in the language here, not being a lawyer, that reflects mm -hmm. that we are, we are trying to take over curriculum. Right. So I think you might want to just look at, and I'd be happy to talk okay. with you folks out. about maybe some options, but I would yeah. say lines 4 through 16 on page 8. Um, Cause you to wonder exactly what, where that might be going. Okay. Dylan, if you can follow up. On that. Um, and then finally, for ethnic and social equity work to be effective in schools, districts need more than a policy mandate or new standards. And we realize that this all this bill does for now is create an, um, an advisory group, a working group. But the expectation is that they're going to produce some recommendations um, that may ultimately lead to new standards or new policy requirements. I think an early first draft of this bill did have some policy um, requirements. Um, this work is extraordinarily important and it's extraordinarily complex. Um, we've had the opportunity to serve on the Vermont NEA's Racial Justice Task Force for two years where they compiled resources for classroom educators to support them in having conversations about race and social justice within their um, classrooms because folks need support in order to navigate these conversations and have them in a really healthy and productive way. Um, and they need to understand how those conversations intersect with school district policy, et cetera. So I think, you know, we need to remind folks that it's not as simple as passing a policy, that we really need, if this is a priority of the state of Vermont, we need to have access to expertise and support for school districts to be able to um, really do this work in a meaningful way and not just check it off the box. Um, I think there are some professional consultants in the state that can support this work. But um, I think it's a limited cadre of folks, and there's certainly nobody at the Agency of, Ex of Education that I would refer people to in terms of um, here's support around curriculum or et cetera. So I just want to make sure that we're, if we're going down this road, and I believe it is an important road to go down, we need to treat it um, with the seriousness that it deserves and, and, and make sure we're being mindful of the resources that are required. Um, Otherwise, we will just compound frustration in the field about another new thing that we have to um, navigate um, and, and without sufficient resources to support um, educators in doing it well. Um, so a focus on ethnic and social equity is very important um, to the work we do, both for the costs that are incurred when students don't feel seen, heard, honored, respected in their schools and for the benefits for all students when every student has what, what she needs in order to succeed in school. So I do not want in any way leave the impression that we don't think this is important work. Um, but we do think there's some details to be worked through. Um, first and foremost, how, how is the agency going to be equipped to support this work um, so that we ensure that it um, progresses and doesn't stall out, but it progresses in a way that recognizes both how, how important it is and how complicated. We are aware of initiative fatigue. <clears throat> well, and you don't want to relegate issues like this to, but, and there's a lot happening. Yeah. As you've heard. Questions? Question about data. Uh, this this um, H3 does, at some points, contemplate that we need uh, disaggregated data um, right. for different social groups, different ethnic sure. groups. And I'm just thinking about um, my school board experience. When we when we're looking for disaggregated data, usually on socioeconomic uh, measures, and that sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Right. Can you just speak to the sources of data available to those who would develop curriculum, whether it's you know professional staff, superintendents? By way of, of you know policy or mm -hmm. whoever it may be, just sort of 
what's the data that's there now, and what are our chances of having good and better data going forward, and where would it come from? Where right. should it come from? Right, right. So I think there's um, folks in the room that could obviously um, also respond to that in terms of the agency's work on a, um, the annual snapshot of school perform and SU performance data that will have equity indicators. Um, and that is drawing from a range of state level assessments from SBAC tests to other um, assessments that, that they, can, they can speak to. So our hope is that um, there will currently, um, the agency collects data from your administrators um, uh, uh, and it sort of goes to the agency and then depending on your administration and their level of some districts have hired like a data analyst and they have expertise and the ability to to crunch their own numbers and and um, start to show trends uh, with disaggregated student populations etc and others really don't have that kind of technical expertise mm -hmm. in-house so I think the hope is that we'll move to this state platform which will allow everyone it's not just the data goes to the agency and then we we don't quite know what picture it paints but there's going to start to be a picture painted around student performance disaggregated by um, by student groups but it's still going to be my understanding is at the SU or SD level because we have such small schools um, with sometimes very small um, subsets of student groups that it's impossible to disaggregate the data without revealing student identi um, identity. So I think that's always going to be a challenge in Vermont um, when we're asking for disaggregated data is depending on the end size you may not be able to produce those results. And I think in a lot of boards cases when you when you were um, dealing with student data from a single school with a class of you know 20 kids or fewer, um, seeing disaggregated results was not possible sure. because you would quickly know which students were eligible for free and reduced lunch or which students were on IP, et cetera. So I think moving to district results at the SU or SD level helps um, eliminate some of that concern. Um, and I'm hopeful that this new data dashboard, which has been, I think, on pause because of the longitudinal data system challenges um, will start to help um, mm -hmm. district decision makers better identify, you know, trends in the areas to be focusing on. Um, on the makeup of the working group, you had indicated that perhaps including perspective from Visbit would be mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. Would you be inclined um, on line four of page five, it says the executive director of VSBA or designee, would you be inclined to find a member there that was mutually agreeable to Bisbet and VSBA? Mm -hmm. As that yeah, I, as I, mean, yeah, I think we can, we can, I mean, I know that there's always concern about making groups that are too big. This is a 17 member group. Um, but I would like that, you know, I can't really speak for them. I'm always willing to, I mean, school safety group had a school board member on it and I said we don't know I mean, it really should be a superintendent so we appointed a superintendent to be our designee that so we'll we will always work with it but I also want to give them space to testify and test to their interests without saying I got it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. So there we will be interested in, in making sure that we address those issues that not, I would, the, the committee would our attention is not to be writing curriculum. So I'd be happy to work with somebody from the agency and um, you uh, around, you know, what, even the focus guardrails we could put on that language to make sure that it's producing the intended result. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And yet, Another switch. Um, I am pleased to see the secretary here and the deputy secretary, and they are going to. Um, this is kind of our meet and greet moment. So, we do can you grab another chair? Do you want to come together? How would you like to do this? <coughs> you 
all that comfortable? Can we just do two of you and then how do you do it? Okay. You want to come up? Yeah. So it should be great. Let's get the secretary and deputy secretary up here. Yeah. This is palatial. I am really excited. It's actually comfortable. Is that you? Secretary of Education. Um, we have with me today uh, what comp who comprise our administrative team, the core leadership team of the Agency of Education. I'll have them introduce themselves. I'll we'll start. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary. You go over here. I'll stand up so you can see me. I'm Emily Simmons, I'm the Agency's General Counsel. Nice to meet you, everyone. I'm Ted Fisher. I'm our Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs. I'm Emily Byrne. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. And then so, when you stepped into Molly's role. I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we, we'd be happy to go into any of those who stepped into whose role kind of questions. Um, but I will say we also have uh, Maureen Geddes, mm -hmm. who's uh, my executive administrative assistant, who also serves on this administrative team. Um, the individuals in this room are the core leadership of the agency. Um, I've been secretary since uh, August 13th. Um, I'm a, I'll say, long-serving educational leader in Vermont. I uh, was a superintendent for a number of years, a principal and a teacher. Um, for the last couple of years, I worked at St. Michael's College uh, in higher ed and also uh, was doing quite a bit of consulting on organizational issues, um, somewhat focused on Act 46, but uh, a, lot, a lot of different issues around school, largely working with school districts with some nonprofit organizations. Um, so. One of the things that drew me to the work and when I was interviewing for the position with Governor Scott, um, based on my somewhat 19 years as an education leader in Vermont, was that I, my, one of my hopes would be to improve the organizational performance of the agency. Um, in my view, not necessarily uh, hasn't overly been positive over the years, uh, but has been challenged with a number of issues, um, largely due to the complexity of the education policy space, which I'm sure you're all getting familiar with as you go through your work. Um, so it's, it's a very complex time. There's a lot of things happening in education, or, you know, period, internationally. Um, so it's not just Vermont, but I think the agency has struggled somewhat, and in large part because federal policy has been very intrusive uh, for the first time. You know, we went through this thing, the No Child Left Behind Act, uh, uh, which more or less ended in 2014. Um, so we're at this moment now in history where we're coming out the end of a very intrusive period of federal policy. <laughs> Um, the agency's been uh, struggling, competing demands. Um, for instance, you know, I have my background in uh, information technologies to a certain extent. Uh, in my 19-year history, the agency had never really been successful at delivering on a single statewide information platform. Um, but for whatever reason, now we're trying to do five at the same time. Um, so we have, we have a lot going on. Uh, we have major policy initiatives that Nicole alluded to. Act 77, personalization of learning, uh, Act 173 in special ed, Act 166, the pre-K. So we have major substantive changes in the policy mm -hmm. landscape going on. And then of course, Act 46 to top it off. So the CTE, you know, so we could go on and on. There's a major, we're not sure of major initiatives and structural changes. So one of the things I, coming in as a new secretary, I was sort of determined to do uh, as a large part of the work I did with multi-district supervisory unions was to position them to navigate this time of complexity and, and how do you create clear uh, lines of communication, organizational structures, yet at the same time uh, set the stage for the innovation that's necessary to handle the complexity. So one of the first things I did was to eliminate a deputy position and just go with a single deputy um, my, my first couple of weeks in the agency, I was surprised at a number of programs that were sort of uh, bifurcated by that chain of command. For instance, we'll talk somewhat about data systems at some point, I'm sure. Uh, part of this thing, you'll hear about the SLDS, the State Longitudinal Data System. Part of it resided under one deputy, and the other part resided under another deputy. 
Uh, so issues like that uh, for me were just sort of almost a low hanging fruit to come in structurally make the change as challenging as it was. Um, so that was sort of the first structural change. And then to start with uh, putting together the core administrative cabinet uh, that could advise me and that sort of once again this era of complexity to make sure that I was getting all the information we needed so we could start sort of cross pollinating uh, ideas. And the individuals in this room um, were part of that conversation. Uh, but it was only fairly recently that this cabinet was established. I really want to say first of the year. Uh, we had elements of it in place. Uh, Ted uh, originally was in a different position. Uh, the position that he occupies now was vacant when I arrived. Um, so he was promoted up to, to accept the new position, which subsequently created a vacancy in his position. So we just recently filled that position. Uh, when Emily, uh, when I arrived at the agency, she was uh, Assistant Attorney General as part of a staff attorney configuration, uh, working with Molly Bachman, who some of you know, and Representative uh, just mentioned her. Um, part of the plan um, when I arrived, Molly had worked on was well, how to do with the requirement to have a new staff attorney with Act 173. Um, how, would, how would we manage that? And, uh, I went with Molly's plan, which um, the funding behind Emily's old position was going away. Uh, so we used the 173 money to basically maintain Emily's position and also then use some funds to augment that with some contractual services spe specific, specifically focused on special education. Emily was then, uh, I appointed uh, Emily to be my general counsel uh, sometime after Thanksgiving. Uh, she, she's fairly new in her role as well. That's created a vacancy for uh, a staff attorney, which we hope to be an assistant attorney general level position. Uh, Emily Burns has been fairly stable in her role. She's had the longest experience of any of our cabinet members. Emily, how long have you been with the agency? 18 months. 18 um, months. Maybe 19. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then my deputy secretary, or our deputy secretary, <laughs> has been here even longer, four years. But when I say new in her role, as you know, she was acting secretary. And um, so, you know, there's been quite a bit of change at that level. So you get, you get a sense of sort of the instability or the newness of our organizational structure. Um, I will also you know, just throw out there in terms of capacity issues or staffing issues, um, I had heard like many of you uh, over the years that the agency was understaffed. I was surprised when I arrived at the agency to find that we had 26, about 25 vacancies and only six of which were under active recruitment. So we had a large number of vacancies um, that, from my perspective, were not being actively sought uh, to fill. So um, as I was working with Department of Human Resources, which we centralized across state government to understand what the recruitment practices were across state government, um, they sort of surfaced for me that the Agency of Education has always had a sort of malaise, if you will, in terms of actively, aggressively recruiting folks. Um, and that's, that's played out to a certain extent. Um, but the other point I make, uh, which has been sort of learning for me um, as part of the cabinet, Governor Scott's cabinet, is that um, I always thought the school, you know, enrollments at school, we hear that mantra of you know, numbers of students are going down and so forth. Um, one thing I started to come to appreciate is we have this broader demographic challenge. And so you've heard a lot about that. And that's translating itself into labor shortages. So I have, you know, we've straightened out some things, I think, on recruiting and but we have challenges finding qualified people to fill our positions. Um, so, uh, for instance, the, you had two other positions given to the agency as part of Act 173. The strategy when I arrived uh, by then Deputy Secretary Amy Fowler was to first fill the division head on which these two positions fall under. Um, we had just, uh, Amy had decided that the first recruitment process for that position had failed, so we were in the process of contemplating sending it back out for active recruitment. That's when I arrived. Uh, we had very limited response to that recruitment. I think we had, I want to say, three individuals apply for the position, none of them were really qualified for the position. So we subsequently went back out, that failed again, and um, we then subsequently appointed someone internally, uh, Chris Case, to be the interim director of that division. Um, but we have, you know, that's sort of just some, some basic narrative of the recruitment challenges we face. Um, we have some structural issues that we've been working on, but also just the, the, you know, lack of qualified candidates for some of the positions and the work that we seek people to do. So I would just leave you with that general impression that just because you create a position in the agency doesn't mean we can just find a body to fill the position. Um, and we're, I think, structurally in a better place now to uh, 
see the work, the complexity of it across our different silos within the agency, but we're in a better place to actively uh, do the recruitment that's going to be necessary to retain uh, high quality staff to do the, do the support and work. So uh, why don't we stop there in terms of just general uh, meet and greet. If there's any specific questions you'd like to ask any of us, um, or I invite my staff to chime in as well. Any questions you might have? I'll start. Um, we are very concerned about 173 and the lack of capacity to be able to play. That was a really big one. And the impact um, around the state in terms of the ability to prepare for that, particularly while there's the distraction of 46. Um, we're very worried about capacity at the, at the state level to support our school districts in implementing that in a sea change. Yeah. I think you know. I you know Act 173. If it's okay if I just yeah. I thought we were having a conversation, so I'll just yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. The um, 173 and, and some of this, I think today our hope was to sort of give you a little taste of what we could provide you in terms of technical support or information. And I would just encourage you anytime you have a question. Um, I hope you could count on the agency to provide you sort of just straight up, you know practical sort of advice on how we see it, either legal or financially or just administratively. Um, I see 173 as a major piece of legislation. I'd use the phrase, um, you know, just, I'd say exceedingly large, um, probably greater than Act 46. And it has two components. One is a revision of the financial piece, but the other side of it is a change in practice that's really going to be necessary to carry off the financial piece. I think the agency is well staffed on the financial piece that we have, the, and I call, that's also legal. So, um, and that's sort of step one uh, in getting this launched. So, uh, the advisory group's up and running, uh, working with Molly Bachman when I was talking about the changes in council, we had figured out how we were going to staff 173 as part of this. Um, yes, it's been an additional burden for us to start off on, but I think, I think that part of 173 I'm not so worried about. Um, coincidentally, uh, we've seen, I would say, you know, we've cleared a backlog, if you will, of investigations that we've done in the past. When I was the superintendent, the agency had a huge backlog of investigations of licensed staff. Coincidentally, one of our investigators, Judy Cutler, is also a licensed attorney. We were able to sort of repurpose her or redirect her to take up some of the direction on the rulemaking that's going to be required around the financial and legal aspects of 173. So I would say all in all, I feel pretty good about the legal and financial piece of the 173, that we're in a good place to do that. Um, that'll largely go forward under the state board's rulemaking authority. The second side of it, uh, the professional development piece that's really going to be necessary in order to make the financial end work, uh, we're not so, uh, you know, not so well staffed. Um, and I think the premise there is that we would do some contracting for that. I mean, that's why there was a, there's a grant making RFP process that was embedded in the law. Um, and I think the advisory group has a key role. They've given us some not so positive feedback about that initial uh, sort of thinking. Um, but this will be, you know, sort of a, a theme going forward, I think. To what extent does the agency contain all the experts or are we conveners of expertise augmented by? I'm leaning more to that sort of latter piece. Um, you know, to speak with like sort of Heather's role when I arrived, her deputy commissioner or secretary role, I think it was deputy secretary for research. It had a research and title. Flexible pathways. You know, flexible yeah. pathways. My vision for that was that the Agency <laughs> of Education in Vermont is too small to have like a research wing. You know, that we would contract those functions out to a certain extent with UVM and other partners. Um, that's kind of what we're we're doing for a lot of those sort of research pieces. Um, so I think you know, with 173, I feel pretty good about the one side of it, the financial and legal end of it. Um, you know, we've got some work to do on the other side. Um, but I think the advisory group has a, a to give us some feedback on what they need. Yeah, I just add a little more detail yeah. on um, the just program. Just, oh, yeah, sorry. I, I have Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary, Agency of Education. Thanks. Um, so the two positions that are um, undergirding the technical assistance for um, Act 173 are currently under recruitment, and are, the finalists are just about to be uh, interviewed in the next couple of weeks, so we should have an update on that. Um, we, we had, though, a series of retirements mm -hmm. that really had nothing, I don't think, anything to do with the transition that was happening. So the division director had already planned to retire Karen Edwards, I think that many of you know. Then her assistant director also retired. 
And um, most recently in December, the state um, education, uh, special education director retired. So they've all retired because they were tired. <laughs> And they had been working, these folks had been working for 20, 25 years, like many of them. Um, it's in a the movement problem. Yeah, so, so I, um, I think that, um, just to kind of echo what Secretary French said, I think we have been moving as speedily as we can. I don't want to leave the committee with the impression that we've just been kind of doing nothing. But um, we have had a substantial amount of turnover through retirements that the, those are the sort of core of who would be making those initial hiring decisions. So we've really had to kind of backfill that a little bit. And I think we're making progress. Uh, in the previous biennium, uh, we were provided an organizational chart that described the portion and funding sources um, that funded positions. Could we get another copy of that? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. That was a really helpful tool to visualize the the agency, and it would be helpful to compare where you were a couple of years ago to where we are now so that the committee understands those changes. Yeah, we have the org chart on the website is the old one, so that would be easy enough to give you the baseline, and the, the new one's in a web tool right now, but we're about to translate that into a comparable tool as the old one, so you'll be able to do that. Great, thank you. The hires, are they in state, out of state? Are the broader getting, pattern? Yeah, are we getting... <laughs> Any yeah, I think you know, the, from New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to you know, if you contemplate what what uh, Deputy Sec Secretary Boucher was saying a minute ago about um, you know the turnover and the leaders that would be actually making these decisions, and yet the expectation the field would have that we were going to find two people to lead uh, a pro professional development conversation around implementing this new law. Um, those new recruits aren't coming from school districts. I mean, they have to come from some place. Uh, but would they ever have, you know, the expertise necessary to lead a, lead a statewide conversation on changing this practice? You know, so it's, for me, it's sort of a setup to almost like be a failure to begin with. It's like we're creating the positions, but who are these people that we're contemplating? But we, you know, we're trying everything right now. Uh, you know, so we'd love to see internal candidates. We'd love to see other candidates from other agencies in state government. We'd love to see out-of-staters. We're casting our net as deep and wide as we can. But the pattern, there has been no common pattern to our recruitment currently. I think it's a mix. Yeah, it's a mix. We're, we, we have benefited. The state went to a new platform around October 1st. Uh, so we've been benefiting. I think I, I see larger numbers of applicants coming into our, our advertising, which is good news. Uh, we're leveraging social media better. Um, but I don't, I don't see a pattern yet to, to that. How, how does the salary compare? I'm assuming this is a math level yeah so position. right so this is a conversation I had with the directors of special education uh, early on who uh, you know, it's the leadership from our state association who are concerned on some of these vacancies and I said to them well how many of you are going to be applying for these jobs you know because it's really I need one of you these kinds of positions I need one of you and the salary is basically half of what they get in the school districts so if that's the case then we have to assume we're not competitive necessarily with school districts, so why would we spend our time recruiting on schoolspring.com when we can't really compete uh, for those types of candidates? And we've had folks from out of state who retired and, you know, basically would come to Vermont. They think it's a, you know, an easy cakewalk to come in and, you know, love to live in rural, pleasant Vermont. You know, but these are very complex positions. So I think we're at the place of needing to really reimagine a recruitment strategy. Like most businesses in Vermont, we have to really think about who's responding to these and who would be responsive to these types of recruitments. I don't know how the level, I don't know how pay skills work. Yeah, I mean, so it's, we need it's not, the, well, yeah, it's a state government it. issue. I think it's also, uh, my theory is that we need folks that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, master's level special educators per se. We need some of those people, but the other positions, we need people that are really skilled at project management. Right. How to, how to implement things, how to convene the team expertise. Those, that, that group of folks, I think we can, we can pull from someplace else if, we're, if we can just imagine that. Uh, have you advertised in mountain bag, biking magazines? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we're almost Not to that yet, place. But but, yeah, <laughs> the governor likes to tell that story. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, yeah. if I shift gears a little bit. Um, a lot of press about um, what you described as a thought experiment. Oh, yeah. Um, concerning the concept of a one school district. Right. So I've heard it described as a thought experiment. I've yeah. heard it described as actually a um, 
a relatively robust discussion that is consuming some capacity and time of our educational leaders. And could you qualify kind of what that's yeah. all about and, and where it is? Yeah, and I certainly, um, I, would, I would welcome the opportunity to come in and spend some more time on that. I think it's deserving of some <coughs> focused time. Um, but I will say it's uh, probably all of the above. Um, I, I think as, as someone who has testified before this committee in the past, and just listening today, I had the opportunity to stop in for about 45 minutes. I think, um, you know, one of, the, one of the features of Vermont policymaking and education is we have a lot of stories. And everyone has a different perspective and therefore has a different story. Um, and they're not, they're not to say one's better than the other, but everyone has a story. Uh, from my perspective, uh, just so you know my story, I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying my, my perspective, I started out as a teacher and became a principal. And when I was working at St. Michael's College, I was working with folks who were aspiring to be principals. I've never yet met anyone who went from the teacher role to the principal role who found that to be a life-altering experience. Okay, Meaning that someone, when you step up to be principal and you find out, you look at the whole thing as a system in the building, it's a different experience than a teacher pers perspective. You know, It really is eye-opening. Likewise, when you go to a principal to become a superintendent, you start to contemplate what is the complete district experience. It is revelatory. Uh, for me, going to state government, in spite of my, in spite of my 19 years, has also been eye-opening. And um, my, my conceptualization of leadership is just, you should not just count on me to provide some sort of diagnosis, but also some, some sort of opening into the vision of the future. Uh, so what I, I use the paper basically the vis, uh, vehicle to suggest to you my perspective based on my experience of state government after four months looking across the whole state is to say and also I would just say working with the staff of the agency and watching them struggle through trying to administer all the various programs and the competing initiatives that have been burdened on the system in the last couple of years that my conclusion is one uh, we have an overly complex system based on the scale and the number of students. We, you know, just, I'm just, my clinical diagnosis from that perspective, it's overly complex. The difficulties we have in filling positions that we just talked about, the difficulties in launching information systems, providing quality and equity, which I see are the two fundamental aspects of the state's role in education, all these things are challenged by the, the significant complexity that we have as an education system. And we are off the charts in terms of complexity, all right? And I can give you some numbers if you, if you care to visit those. But I'll give you an example. For instance, we're often compared to West Virginia on the issue of school district consolidation. West Virginia has about 280,000 students and consolidated down uh, to 51 school districts. We have 75,000 school districts consolidating after Act 46 down to 150 school districts. So anything we do at the state level is required to administer to all that granular complexity at the local level. So my conclusion number one is that you know, we're overly complex. Two, I started to conceptualize what is, you know, I'm thinking about what is the role of state government in education, in Vermont education. I see it as twofold. One, to ensure quality and ensure that quality is equally distributed across the state. Quality and equity. That's the fundamental role I see of state government. My second conclusion is, the, you know, one, we're overly complex, but two, the complexity is actually now interfering with our ability to ensure quality and equity. You heard a few minutes ago about measuring equity. We can't begin to measure those things effectively due to this complexity. We can try. We're going to do our best. But one should not be surprised that we're challenged by this. Third conclusion I would make is that the complexity is now the root cause of our high inefficiency, as measured by finances, you name it. You know, we just we are a highly inefficient system largely due to this complexity. The good news is is we created the complexity. So the one school district as a prescription is not meant to say we're going to go down that road of having one school district, though I know greater minds than mine have envisioned that in the past. But the point is that we should start down a path of intentionally designing our future. And that, that path will largely, to me, means becoming simpler so that we can achieve our goals of quality and equity. So I, I put that out there as sort of a, a to get the conversation started. Um, it's a conversation that percolated in the cabinet of state government because I think another dimension of, of resolving the complexity issue is that we also need to deal with the integrated need to have education more thoughtfully brought together with other social services. And that's, that's something that needs to be provoked sooner rather than later. 
but the other end of it, I think, now is to, um, to embellish this document. The first round of it, I wrote myself. And then the people in the room contributed to that, um, you know, to, to round it out in what was called version two. What I'm seeking to do now is to translate that document into a website, because I, I think it's already unwieldy as a 37-page document. And I'm seeking to have some folks round off the bookends of the policy, meaning cradle to rear. We're looking for some embellishment on the higher ed piece of it. Um, you know, to what extent would a simplification of the K-12 system enhance our ability to, to you know, resolve the higher ed issue in the state, which is also challenged by demographics, and then to look more systemically at um, early education. So it's not going anywhere fast. We're not here today, and I won't be in the coming months, uh, introducing language around creating a single, <laughs> creating a single district. But I think um, you'll hear me, when you hear me talk about complexity and our complexity issue, it's a really a response to that because I think we we really we've done it to ourselves to a certain extent. Um, we have really I think have consensus in the state about education being important and that it should be an opportunity available to every Vermont student. My take it from what it is. My diagnosis of the situation today as an experienced Vermont educator is that we we are at jeopardy of not being able to achieve those things unless we get a grip on grip on simplifying our infrastructure. In, in terms of complexity, you described uh, state-driven policy complexity and how that implementation looks in our education system. Can you describe the federal pieces that lend to that complexity and what they mean for the agency as you try to remain compliant with federal law? Yeah, I think it's a great point because part of the other, um, one of the other dynamics I was responding to as secretary, um, and I, you know, I'm new on the job, but I sense, based on my experience navigating federal policy, I sense we have a window of opportunity to have a Vermont-led conversation about what we want to see for our education system in the future. Um, we've, we've come out the end of No Child Left Behind Act. You know, we were one of the few states that didn't get a waiver from its more onerous requirements. And what that meant was that we labeled every Vermont school a failing school in 2014. So we're at a place now with ESSA, which ESSA, the Every, Stu Every Student Succeeds Act, was really designed to give states more flexibility. And my impression so far is that you know we have greater flexibility to do that under ESSA than we have for No Child Left Behind Act. So I think, yes, we have federal, federal requirements, but we're at a point now in history where those federal requirements seem to be le le less restricted than they ever have been. And perhaps there's an opportunity, if not an invitation, from the federal government for us to articulate a Vermont path forward. I don't suspect that window to be open forever, um, but I think I haven't. I haven't felt. I invite my other staff to, to contribute to this. I haven't felt that we're under significant pressure in a policy direction from the federal government right now. Emily, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just add um, Emily Byrne, the chief financial officer for the agency. The um, the only thing I would add is there is complexity on the funding side of things. So the requirements. The way that the federal government structured the funding that runs from the feds to local agencies is always through the state education agency. So to the extent the agency of Ed Vermont's agency of education is in effect an arm of the federal government and we are sort of responsible for managing the dollars that the federal government has allocated for education and holding local schools responsible for the rules that the federal government has put into place, coupled with whatever requirements come on top of that from the agency of administration and sort of through state law. To the extent the agency has to hold schools accountable to procurement laws and sort of regulatory um, regulatory stuff around funding, there is a sort of complexity in terms of how the agency is poised to interact with schools and how those school like how that back and forth district, excuse me, how that back and forth happens and then what we're accountable to the federal government. So in that sort of middleman piece also comes into play. So that sort of feeds into the complexity of what the federal government is holding us accountable to on the funding side and how that kind of plays into what the agency is doing. Yeah, we, we have a, a lot of capacity spent on handling all those middleman functions because we have so many local areas to administer. So to, to be direct, um, yes, ma'am. Are we expecting to see something come forward from you this year that's going to start looking at your your plan? No. Thank 
Yeah, and that's you know, sort of the other side. I want to talk about the future, but yeah. I also have you know, my bias or my, my lens, primary lens as a new secretary, having been a superintendent for many years, is that I want to focus on fidelity of implementation of the initiatives that we have on the table. Thank okay? you. Thank you. And um, we have, I'm predicting 173 will be a major piece of work that's going to require our full attention. I say our, I mean the field as well as the AOE. Um, I, I'm encouraging the State Board to go back and revisit the education quality standards because I think that's where, you know, m many of the things we get into are about getting a tight definition of what we mean by quality, and I think they're poised to do that. And that will get us into Act 77 and some of the, the issues around personalized learning, which folks have been struggling with. Um, so I think, I think we have enough on the table right now. I actually can't imagine too many policy spaces that you would not be involved and that are, you know, already, already have major initiatives, like 166. <coughs> um, and you meant, did mention ESSA, and we are, how are we doing in terms of our, our timeline with the federal government? Have you tried to say, if you could just, just do a yeah, couple of seconds. Right, uh, Secretary yeah. comment Yeah, yeah, um, we're doing fine. So, um, and I, I will come back in, I think, on Thursday to talk with you about the SLDS. Um, yes. which I think might be where some of the concerns are arising around um, us meeting our deadlines. SLDS is the data system? Yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah. Um, acronym land. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, right now, um, there are, we have an internal deadline, for instance, on the report card of December. Mm -hmm. It's looking like that's actually going to be in the spring when we're actually able to launch the report card. Um, and I'll talk more about that on Thursday. But that, we're still compliant with our state law. Like, there isn't any kind of stick from the federal government currently that's saying you're out of compliance on this particular ESSA plan. So nobody is in jeopardy of experiencing something that feels like a government shutdown <laughs> in their schools. There's no problem of money coming to our schools. No, and I would actually look to Emily to speak to, that, um, we, we reallocated Title I funds, for instance, and I don't know if you want to speak to that. Right. So, the, so one of the um, requirements under ESSA was to identify so some schools that needed additional support because we didn't have the data to do that. We do have the flexibility with the federal um, funds to kind of reallocate them back into the pool. So because we couldn't identify the schools, we were able to take that money that was initially set aside specifically for those identified schools, drop it back into the Title I allocation, and then push it back out to schools to spend. So there isn't a pot of money that the agency is sitting on, I think, in that particular space. Could you remind us what percentage of the AOE employees are working as that arm of the federal government? <laughs> well, it uh, was upwards of 80%. I think we have had three or four state positions, so maybe we're inching down towards 72? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if I like the, the arm of the federal yeah. government. No, yeah. Grant, yeah. Grant funded. 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 Yeah. 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 funded. Yeah. Emily, is that? It's a significant chunk, and we'll yeah. make sure that to have all that data yeah. in our budget presentation, but it is yeah. a large amount. And to yeah. the extent, just to put it out there, a lot of the federal grants have not been, there has not been a change in some of the like the small state minimums which Vermont gets. So the bigger states, the amount of administrative funds that are given to the states is sort of dictated is a percentage of how much is actually given. But the smaller states get this kind of cap, and those caps aren't changing and they aren't growing. So to the extent the agency has kind of had to figure out, given a fixed set of funds, because there's not a lot coming from the state in terms of support for those programs, there's more pressure on us you know, on a smaller on the on the same pool of funds, right? State employee contract keeps increasing, healthcare costs keep increasing, the share of retirement keeps increasing, so that pool of money is not buying as much as it used to. Um, so I think we're sort of at that juncture of how much federal dollars do we have, given the positions that we have, you know, to the extent the state is backfilling those federal dollars, or are we doing making other decisions um, around our resources is a real thing. In terms of uh, vacancies, you indicated that you discovered there were a lot of positions held vacant. Um, without getting into the world of our appropriations committee, do you claim vacancy savings? How does that sugar off for the Yeah, that's, that's embedded as a formula, I've learned, as a formulaic response to budget development. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, I just underscore, I'm not, 
I've observed a certain certain hiring situation. We're addressing that, and you heard me characterize the labor market and who might apply. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not short of resources yet. I mean, we're going to make that assessment as a team as we get clearer about our structure. I think there's places on the, the positions where we're funded by the general fund in particular that we might need some more support. The grant funded aspects, you know, that 80% of the work that we do, that's where the bulk of the vacancies are. You know, those, those positions are attached to certain discrete activities. The, the less sort of uh, glamorous activities of just making state government run, those general fund positions are ones like Emily's area, those are ones where we're, we're doing some significant restructuring, and those are ones I'm going to, don't expect me not to come back with a request for more resources on that side, because I think that's where, you know, we, we need to get a handle on what is the agency actually requested to do, uh, what requirements do you have, and then we're going to do an assessment of what, what resources we might need on that side of it. It's a complex. Is that the same thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, just a quick follow-up oh, yeah. if I could. And forgive me, it, it, can, it can wait. We can discuss this another time. But you also indicated uh, looking at roles of the agency where a contracted service may provide value where a position previously had. Would that be a federal expenditure for those contracted services, or would that be general fund dollars? It could be both. I think there's opportunities. Uh, I mean, I, I see that as like in the case of 173, you know, part of that there was a anticipation of us needing to contract out for technical assistance on professional development. So we put out the RFP, but those were essentially local or state monies that did that. So it's a it's a blend of both. And I think one of the things we're trying to achieve, we the structure is right, we we can see an opportunity to pull the two together to advance one discrete set of goals, you know, so we're we don't have necessarily federal requirements taking us in the direction we don't want to go as a state. Um, when was it? Oh, excuse me. Who represented Austin? Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could just share your thinking on and um, on expanding opportunities for high school students or even middle to high school students other than going to college. What you know, I I think that you know the governor seems to be very positive about technology education, and I'm wondering, you know, what your thinking is on and how that could possibly happen. Yeah, I think it's, uh, like most rural states, this is a huge issue uh, for Vermont. And I, I don't know if I mentioned, I started my career in Canaan, Vermont. For, I was up there That's 15 funny. years, yeah. Okay. So they're the students I think of the most mm -hmm. um, when I think of opportunity. And uh, interestingly, I think we're also, it's a great time to be a student in the world today. We have the opportunity to deliver all kinds of stuff to students. And it's expanded uh, learning opportunities that really are now, I think, increasingly calling into question some are, are more limited rural offerings that we provide students. So I know, you know the governor is very interested, I'm very, very interested, uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher, this is her area of expertise. Um, so we're, you know, we see it as sort of a cradle career. A lot, of, a lot of work due to our demographic situation needs to be focused on how we can uh, really work from student aspirations to help them find a place in the Vermont landscape to live and work. Um, and that's, that's something we have to work, and once again, back to my theme of complexity, we need to break down the barriers so students can, can have more flexible access to the different mm -hmm. programs they might want to see. Right now we have, we've created a lot of sort of pathways, but those con pathways have like sort of Jersey barriers on them, and it's hard mm -hmm. to move back and forth in and among those programs for yeah. kids. So we need, we need to break down some of those silos for kids. But I, I see us, you know, the real call for us in terms of quality is how do we offer a 21st century world class, which is this expansive curriculum, to kids in our most rural locations. If we can do that, then we've, we've achieved a certain amount of equity in, mm -hmm. on behalf of our state. Can I just add a little piece? I mean, I, I, I would love to come back in and, and show you what we've been doing in the area of career pathways, <coughs> for instance, yeah. mm -hmm. where it's really changing It's really changing the conversation. So starting in the early grades, um, it isn't, are you going to college or are you not? It's really, what are the options for your life and how do you actually figure out at that time you are what you might want to do. And so um, this body actually uh, provided a career pathways coordinator for us um, who's now been there for a year and a half and he's been doing some great work um, on building career pathways. Um, stemming um, primarily right now from the career uh, and tech education. Um, work <laughs> no, um, but but certainly has applicability for all students and really starting at that 
middle school and mm -hmm. a little earlier. So I'm very excited by it and be happy to come and, and share that, an update on that work. Um, That'd be great. I have a thank question. you. I have to slip out for a minute. Um, we're hearing from the State Board of Ed and the advisory group that they need help. They, they're lacking resources that typically came from the agency. Um, is there any hope for them? Well, yeah, I, I would, you know, just underscore uh, Dep Deputy's remarks. I mean, anytime you have a question on something, you, you want some, ex you know, our expertise, we're happy to come in and, and provide that to the committee. So, you know, don't hesitate to ask us to come in. We'd love to do that. I think the, the question of resources, I think, you know, uh, I serve on the state board as an unvoting member. Um, they're going through a bit of an existential conversation. I think every state board does that periodically, in my experience. Um, they're happy to be out from underneath Act 46. Um, and that sort of caused some of it. Um, but there are some state board members who, you know, question why the state board even exists at all. Um, you know, and I think uh, from my, per my perception that um, when we made this change to secretary from commissioner, uh, we, you know, the legislature created the basic framework to make that happen, but now it's a good time to go back and revisit that. Um, back to my complexity theory. Um, I'm concerned about having multiple policy-making bodies uh, in education. I don't think it's served us well, per se, that one of the issues that's contributed to complexity is when the state board thinks it's making policy and it has a certain policy-making authority, or this committee making policy in conjunction with the governor's authority. So I think we need to sort that out and get much more intentional. I'm going to leave Representative Cooper in charge. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, is there anybody at the agency who's looking at sort of the future of online learning and where it fits in and is it any good, that sort of thing? Yeah, we have a, a, a position that's designed to education technology and has been largely responsible for coordinating infrastructure around broadband development, working, you know, we launched the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative under, you know, with that position's direct involvement. So this is Peter Drescher, um, who does quite a bit of work on, you know, coding activity with students. So we've, we've got a lot of different pieces that run through that position at the agency. And, and he works closely with our proficiency-based learning team. He's, he's now housed in the Flexible Pathways Division, mm -hmm. so it's a much more integrated um, body of work now, I would say. It just seems like there's, there's so much out there. It's overwhelming. Yeah. It's hard to know what's, you know, what's snake oil and what isn't. Yeah. And uh, it's almost like you need a, a point person to really be able to yeah. test and, it. And part of it is this idea of open education resources, what we call OER, which is really where the channel, you know, curriculum today isn't like buy a textbook, as I heard reference in the prior. It's really about how do you how do you take all these different pieces and mash it up in a structured way. So if you create something, the teacher in the other district can take it and mash it up and contribute back to it. So there's whole platforms dedicated to OER management. Um, that I think we have to get a lot more intentional about in Vermont. It's exciting also, but it's really, you know, challenging. Could be great. <laughs> <laughs> a question for you. I was very surprised to see that you were moving. Yes. Can you give us some background on that? I sure. Having worked with the Agency of Natural Resources and the Agency of Transportation on the Water Quality Bill, it was very valuable as Tropical Storm Irene that they were together and we were able to oh. do that. And now, we're, so we're separating that, but I don't see how we're putting you near anybody that yes. that creates, I mean, A&R uh, is great, yes. but I, I'm not sure I get the, the nexus there. Yeah, I think, well, there's some synergies with ACCD, which are up on the sixth floor, okay. but the, um, you know, back to my perception coming in that I wanted the agency to be a better performing entity, um, during the interview process, it was floated to me, you know, we might want to move you, and I am, I said yes, that would be great, because there's nothing like a move uh, to do organizational culture work. Uh, but it is challenging. But I, you know, from what I understand, um, it's a complex decision, it involves several elements. One was, we're currently in Barry City Place, and Barry City Place was underutilized, meaning the state was paying a lease payment, but not all the space was being occupied. So there was some capacity at Barry City Place. That was a conversation that was going on between AOT and DGS. Um, and then uh, there was interest on the part of National Life itself, which is the landlord, uh, to take back more space, or they wanted more of a presence on their main floor. So they were in a conversation with DGS about uh, their space needs in their own campus. And then the fire happened. That was just, you know, it happened, and that precipitated really looking more systematically at all these issues. So. Uh, that presented itself with a solution where 
Barry City Place could be more fully occupied if AOE moved out because we only occupy two floors there. And coincidentally, AOT can pretty much take over the whole space as I understand it. So that's what that was the beginning of this sort of move. A and R also had some other other space being utilized in National Life. So the, the whole plan was put together. And the fourth agency is Agency of Digital Services, which we have ADS employees that are embedded in our agency, like the other agencies. So there was a whole interest in rethinking how they're provisioned. So there were at least four agencies involved, and it was a fairly complex decision, but I think it was largely firstly driven not so much by synergies, but by just being more effective use of our state spaces that we were paying for and uh, saving some money. So we're, we're right now, we're scheduled to move no sooner than March 1st. So that's that's the latest word on that as if of I today. If I had a magic wand, I'd be moving you next to a AHS. Right. Um, because we certainly see the number yes. of problems that are happening right. between those two agencies. Yep. Sometimes proximity can help, and I don't see that we, we've helped you at all yeah. in that regard. Yeah, and the other thing I've noticed, AHS is very large compared to us. You know, so yeah. I think if, if we were next, then we'd probably be assumed by them to a certain extent. But no, it's um, we certainly endeavor to work closely together, but they're a much larger, more complex agency than the Agency of Education. Other questions? Just reiterate our interest in working with you, whatever we can do to support your work. Um, on behalf of Vermont, we, you know, don't hesitate to reach out and give us a call. So we do have customer schedule for the agency on each week? We do. I believe so. It is. Actually, they just had it rescheduled to Friday. That's yeah. not going to work. Can you help us? Yeah, well, you know, our, our people will work on the schedule as best we can, you know, so yeah. just, just. We have them for tomorrow, and yep. they, they could not. So yep. um, I can, I'll ask them to. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll try our best to shuffle the deck and see what we can do for you. Yeah, we're trying to vote that out on Thursday, so okay. the agency's input is important to us. That's good to hear. <laughs> We'd love mm -hmm. to provide it. <laughs> so even if it could be Thursday, we could bring it okay. Thursday morning. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Madam Chair? Yeah. So I just asked for anyone who announced themselves to the record today from the Agency of Education, if you could please come see me when we're done and just write down your name, your title. I have some of you listed, but not all of you, because I didn't know who would be coming. So if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. That's an amazing system. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, Heather, you're coming back to talk to us about data, correct? Yes. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday. I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you.